Hello and welcome to this eighth edition of the Echo Chamberlain livestream, which still, despite all the odds, uh, is still not named the Echo Chamber. Uh, we celebrate a week in which Bob Iger, the weatherman, is at the heart of a cyclone at Disney, and we mourn the end of the two-year-long career of the fantastic Lizzo. To discuss this and more, uh, I'm joined by a lovely panel of guests. And uh, first up, the United States national debt had just crossed $34 trillion and is currently adding a million dollars every 30 seconds. Most of it can be attributed to the babysitting, college fund, and daycare expenditure of my first guest. From the great state of Illinois, it is Mr. Greg Owen. Good evening, sir. Thank you for having me. And I, I don't think you have to worry too much. I don't think there's much difference between a billion and a trillion. Uh, I think just the one letter there in the beginning. So... It's really not as bad as it seems. I mean, six, seven trillion, who cares? What's a couple trillion between friends? You know what I mean? Hey. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen? Like, it's gone past the point where it could never actually be paid. So why even bother counting it as a metric anymore? Uh, you know, that is the same question that I ask myself constantly. We just print it and it's worth less. And I believe the proposed budget that President Biden just put out calls for our budget next year to be seven and a half trillion dollars and uh and just the service on the debt that we have uh is mm -hmm. just shy of a trillion next year we'll be over a trillion in 2026 it's uh really astounding honestly this mm. is like weimar republic type shit going on here it is yeah i mean why bother even servicing the debt if the debt's never going to get paid it doesn't make any sense so um, yeah every taxpayer now uh um owes approximately a quarter of a of a million per taxpayer so are you gonna go to the uh, irs and just fill it out tomorrow get it over and done with i mean i would except uh that same amount won't be worth as much later so i'm just gonna keep putting it off like uh well like the government is doing so you know <laughs> yeah oh well um well you keep tight over there because we're going to be joined by another yank um so my next guest is streaming with us after pulling over at the side of the new jersey turnpike he had a two-second cameo as a corpse in a blood-spattered uh, shootout scene in the eighth episode of the fourth season of The Sopranos, and Bruce Springsteen calls him the boss. From uh, the Garden State, it is Dark Hour. I, I was uh, once pulled over on the New Jersey Turnpike. It sucks. It, they really don't <laughs> want... The, 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 <clears throat> the New Jersey State Troopers do not want to listen to you, and I train with a bunch of them, so it's... Uh, <laughs> But, uh, uh, yeah. Full disclosure, I don't actually know what the New Jersey Turnpike is. I just thought it's something that's something to do with New Jersey. Oh, well, that's, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, one of the most annoyingly busy roads in the entire country because it's the main pipeline into New York City from New Jersey. Oh. It, it connects between Philadelphia and New York, so it's a very busy road. And mm -hmm. uh, it's when you get pulled over on it, it, it sucks because they're they're pissed off. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys said about the dollar value and the debt. I'm just my retirement plan at this point is that by the time I turn 65, money will not matter. The world will have collapsed and I'm not going to bother saving it. So Fair enough. I'm going to go. I'm well, saving up scraps of metal for uh, armor pieces. Um, I'm thinking I'm, I'm foreseeing a Mad Max style future. So I'm getting ready. I have a storm. Yeah. So I'm just going to turn into a bunker. <laughs> yeah, maybe all the uh, the survivalists are actually going to be right, like uh, just buying all that that ammo and, and gear and stuff. But uh, yeah, I don't know why you, it's you guys are called the Garden State, but when people think of New Jersey, they just think of gigantic industrial buildup and uh, so. Stuff. So actually, there's a the, the only section that's really industrial buildup is up by New York. So you have like Newark, Elizabeth. Uh, um, Bayonne, that's all industrialized area. But if you go out like south and west, it's a lot. So the entire coastline is obviously, you know, beach. And then when you go out west, there's a lot of farmland all the way out to Pennsylvania. So yeah. there's actually a lot of really nice areas that are just kind of forgotten about because everyone just thinks about that small section up by New York when they think. Because most, most people fly into Newark Airport when they come to, to New Jersey. So. I get you. 
Well, uh, the great despot of Antrim will be joining us eventually. It's a little early in his part of the world, so he's dragging himself out of bed, I bet. Uh, but he'll be here anon. Or he forgot the time difference, one of the two. So anyway, let's get underway and get into some news. <clears throat> All right. I'm a little worried that no one in the chat, not even any New Zealanders, has recognized and called out uh, Billy T. James in that news intro. But one day it'll happen. So anyway, I wanted to start off by talking about uh, just a whole big spread of mid. <coughs> you get yeah. the, the, the yeah. Godzilla and the, the, the big monkey dude, King Kong fella thing, uh, new empire. And then you've got just a mid Ghostbusters frozen empire. And you've got a mid roadhouse bouncer empire. Everything is just a whole bunch of dumb mid stuff with empires in it. Uh, we've even got Owen's Wrath, Midwest Empire, just uh, just a whole bunch of content to do with that. <laughs> All of that. Uh, when does this come out, uh, Greg, by the way? Uh, that's going to be, uh, uh, well, it uh, it came out last month, it looks like. So. All right. Yeah. Actually, it, it, came, out, it came out two months ago, apparently. <laughs> it's already, oh, well, well, yeah, it's it's already, already out, out for a month know. and a half. <laughs> Yeah, oh, well. I missed my own red carpet. Damn. Oh well. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to start off with this whole bunch of just dull, pure midness, and that thing I was talking about a little while ago of just this trap we could fall into of thinking, okay, well it's not crap, therefore I can feel pleasant about it and I can feel good about it. Uh, you know, but the monkey thing, everyone's been talking about it, saying that it's just pure mid and there's nothing uh, particularly cool about it and it's very formulaic and paint by numbers. And the Ghostbusters, again, just crowded and bloated with characters and no magic or effervescence or charm to it whatsoever. Uh, and then, you know, just a random roadhouse. Might as well chuck that in. So has anyone actually gone to see any of this mid content? I saw Godzilla X-Kong and I watched Roadhouse. I did not see Frozen Empire. I decided to skip on that one. Mostly because I hadn't, I didn't see uh, the previous one either. So I was like, I'm not going to bother. Yeah. No, I haven't. I, I didn't get a chance. I was on um, out for vacation last week, so I haven't got a chance to see any of this stuff. And uh, the only one that even looks mildly interesting is Godzilla Kong. Just just because I'm not expecting it, I'm just expecting you know a, an action mindless kaiju battle thing. So mm -hmm. I don't. I think that will bother me the least. <clears throat> it's it's pretty. You pretty much hit the nail on the head. It's the the first act is super fast. They try to like bang, 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 give you all these details. Then the second act slows down. Ridiculous. They actually have multiple big monster fights that you just happen off screen, which annoyed the shit out of me. Cause I'm like, that's why I paid for the ticket. Uh, but the it's, it doesn't insult you too much. And if that's the best way I could put it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. You know, obviously, I don't want to use like terms like woke and all that stuff because it's like it doesn't do. It's just very like like you said, paint by numbers. Uh, it's fun at points. There's some flaws, and uh, I guess I can't speak for Ghostbusters and Roadhouse was just pointless. They should they, mm -hmm. they shouldn't have even done that one. No one's throat even got ripped out. So no, you know, got ripped out the throat. But uh, <laughs> I should have put that on the on the the poster. Like um, you, know, you won't hate it or you, it won't disappoint you. <laughs> Whatever you said then, yeah. but. Uh, it is this a movie, is and you can watch it. Yeah, that's right. But uh, it's a why nice do they, visuals? That's about it. Why do, they, the, why do they clutter it with the, like hollow Earth nonsense that no one cares about, and no one is interested in? Like, why would you overcomplicate something which is designed to be fun and simple and stupid so people can have a big laugh? Yeah, I mean, essentially, the the whole hollow Earth thing is just to have a secondary staging location for Kong to have battles with his people. I guess mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. I, I, anybody who's seen the trailer has seen that there's other giant monkeys and uh, that ho the whole there's a whole section of uncharted area that they go and find and they find all of his people and or all of his monkeys, whatever you want to call them. But the uh, that's it's little, really just a place to have the separate stories. And that's one of the problems with um, almost the entire monster verse series is that except for maybe that first Godzilla movie, all of them are trying to have multiple movies in one. Mm -hmm. And here they separate them. There's like the movie happening in a hollow earth. And then also Godzilla's up on the surface doing his thing. And 
it's mm -hmm. it and that's where it kind of starts to lose you because they keep jumping between these plots it's you know there's the the one with kong and his people in the uh the hollow earth uncharted area the humans in the hollow earth trying to do their thing and then godzilla up on top doing his uh kill ka other kaijus to become pink zilla and mm. it just keeps jumping between these and you never really get a chance to settle on one and then they finally kind of just clash at the end into one story and it's by that point you've already you're it's been two and a half hours and your brain is already pretty much turned off <laughs> uh you, you're never quite sure what the the agency of these things are like sometimes they're just gigantic stupid creatures with who are mindless and get pissed off at stuff and other times they seem to have some kind of intuition about stuff and they're figuring things out and making moral judgments about humanity <laughs> so you never know which one it's going to be from scene to scene uh, yeah. If they were going to do, like, the original King uh, Godzilla worked really well because, you know, when it came out in Japan, it was like a huge metaphor for the atomic blast or a huge metaphor for the awakening, slumbering America. So if they were to make, uh, like, Godzilla or Kong successful today, what would be the, like, the huge energizing metaphor that people would go, oh, like, it's a thing for this, and people would feel it at a latent level? Like, it wouldn't be wokeness. Uh, would no. it be the debt? It'd be the national debt. It'd be the national debt. <laughs> a gigantic <laughs> sprawling creature that just gets bigger and rampages its way and destroys society. Well, that's that's already been made. Uh, Schoolhouse Rock had a whole song called Tyrannosaurus Debt. It was uh, it's a it's a it's a classic. It's a banger. But no, you you hit on a, uh, an interesting point. Is like why these movies all feel kind of hollow because they don't have any sort of theme. Like it's it's per it's obviously perfectly fine for not every movie to be you know a, a, a scorsese film deep you know super well acted amazing you know thing um but even even like our old cheesy action movies had some kind of theme like the old godzilla movies as silly as they look now they had like a metaphor or a theme or something and even the goofy ones even like predator rambo silly you mm -hmm. know over the top action stuff like there was some kind of theme about human resilience or PTSD or something and they don't have to be like I said the the most incredible Oscar worthy best acted best shot thing you've ever seen but there is still a difference between a movie being a hollow just plot driven formulaic piece of crap and having at least some kind of unifying theme some sort of human emotion that ties it all together that even if it is a silly action movie it's still something that you connect with and I think that's what you're not seeing I think it's why Godzilla minus one really wowed everybody because it got back to that original thing uh the theme of that movie was like um uh the guy dealing with you know these feelings of cowardice and and honor and things of that mm -hmm. nature so even though it was a monster battle movie there was a human emotion that they were grappling with mm -hmm. <clears throat> there was also that interesting sense of uh you know society in our cities were already devastated pretty much and just making their way back after after the war and then there's this new thing so that was a fascinating new dynamic rather than something smashing and marauding its way through a, a gleaming new york like with king kong so that was yeah. kind of uh that was kind of cool uh but ghostbusters seems kind of like the most depressing uh to me like that's a film that should have a gleam and a magic to it and an excitement and uh, and be great on so many levels and this just looks like uh, just kind of the worst of fan fiction cobbled together by by AI with no soul to it and Chuck and Bill Murray at the end for for what 20 seconds or whatever how long he's on the screen that's just kind of sad uh, like like grow, growing up like uh, if someone was having a birthday party and you put on Ghostbusters then the parents could just walk away for two hours because they know their kids are going to be super engrossed and laughing their heads off at this cool film who's going to be super engrossed by this film oh yeah I I I think that with the Ghostbuster mo movies, they 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 lost their the gimmick worked that first time really well, and then every time after it just starts to lose a little bit more because it's you can't really surprise much with them, and especially and really the main thing that attracted people to that first one was the cast itself because mm -hmm. it was you know you know Dan Aykroyd Bill Murray they had a history together of being on SNL and they were well known by that. like at this at this point this just seems like random people thrown together for the sake of being a name yeah the more I think about it the 2016 one uh in the right hands that could have been a smash like the the SNL talent on that was really top-notch stuff those those uh 
those those women. So if they'd had a good script, it could have actually succeeded. And if it hadn't looked like, you know, uh, tacky, gaudy garbage on the screen, uh, it could have been really cool. But we'll never know. So that's I, just. The... I do think that these current ones are suffering from that one as well. The 2016 mm-hmm. one built up so much bad will that the subsequent sequels to the originals uh, had this like holdover, <clears throat> almost you know, disdain because of that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's see what's going on here. So this is the big news this week. Uh, I just put out a video about this. Uh, so Bob Iger, the weatherman. Uh, it's interesting with uh, with Disney because like there's no um, impermeable icons anymore. Like uh, um, Kevin Feige used to be like Mister Untouchable, like Mister Heart of the Zeitgeist. Now he's just kind of like a doughy faced guy whose best days are behind him, and he's lost that magic. And Kathleen Kennedy after the Force Awakens, like uh, <clears throat> the Queen on the throne. You know, don't you can't even get near her with uh, what she's done and. Uh, and then you have Dave Filoni, the man in the black hat, who was super cool and rejuvenated Star Wars. Now he's just kind of like this guy who's overplayed his hand and, and doesn't really know what to do and is given too much power. But I never imagined I'd see Bob Iger, like the, a guy made out of Teflon with the most perfectly sculpted image in Hollywood, him, to see him sort of flailing around and having to go into damage control and having to... Uh, pull his resources and and call in his his uh, friends and go on a, a campaign to um to shake off uh, nelson pounce so tomorrow the disney investors uh, are meeting up and they're going to vote on the board and either <clears throat> they're going to stick with uh, bob Iger's board or they're going to go with nelson pounce and uh one of his other guys on the board to to try and shake things up a little bit and uh yeah so you've seen Bob Iger spent forty million dollars on a PR campaign to try and sway the shareholders around, uh, and which is interesting to me because even if he wins, he's still essentially been dealt a black eye either way because his image has been kind of like uh, shaken up, and the media he used to be able to rely on um, have sort of been a bit sort of taciturn and lukewarm about him and even like tested the waters of, of you know, contesting him and, and challenging his preeminence. And so that's very strange to see. So I think the, as far as I can see, there was a little thing where it was shifting towards pounce amongst the shareholders, but then the tide sort of swung the other way. No one wants to be on the losing side. So all the big premier ones are coming in and they seem to be coming behind Iger. Uh, so pounce was pissed off that the the disney shares you know had dipped from like 200 down to 160 or something like that but since then they've picked up again and they seem to have a bit of momentum <coughs> and bob Iger has shuffled around the the slate of films so the more woke ones get pushed behind the deadline so uh that can also be okay for the investors so that's yeah. my my big takeaway is that uh i think bob Iger's is going to win but you know he's just going to get a kick in the shins he is. I, I think he is going to win. And I think that um, <clears throat> the fact that the the price is kind of working up over the last couple of weeks is really that's the that's the thing that's saving him. Because if uh, at the end of the day, these these companies uh, like I read today, <clears throat> a lot of the a lot of the votes are starting to go his way. And that's because, of, like you mentioned, the big players, uh, you know, your vanguards, your T. Rowe Price, uh, your mm-hmm. BlackRock, all, all the big institutions, they're like 100 percent behind him and they collectively control a very large amount of the company so uh he's got a lot of that like you said he still has a little bit of public support he still has that kind of image that he's writing on but i don't know how much longer his career is going to be after this because as you said he just doesn't have the same image anymore he doesn't have the same confidence that anybody uh nobody just innately believes that he has a plan to just lead this company out uh, he doesn't have a plan. His plan right now is quite literally cutting things. He's cutting jobs. He's cutting spending. Mm-hmm. He's cutting movies. Um, there's there's no real creation happening. So short term, yeah, I think the stock price uh, movement is pretty incredible. It's it's up like forty percent of what it was in January December. I think it bottomed out briefly at like seventy eight. It was riding in the eighties, and I think today it was at like one twenty. So you're talking about, you know, a 50% increase in price over just three or four months, which is very impressive. And I'm sure the stock mm-hmm. uh, holders are, are breathing uh, better than they were. But 
a couple of years ago, it was, you know, it peaked at 200 and it was very consistently in the upper 100. So even 120 is, you know, if you're, if you're a long-term holder, you're, you're maybe even after eight, nine years at this point, which <laughs> yeah, is not a great right. look. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, you know, and then he got that dividend last year. That was a little bit of a Hail Mary, I think, to, to pull that out, even though it was only 60 cents. Like if I, if I was getting a 0.4% uh, dividend, I think I would be a little, I'd be a little pissed about that, but um, he's, you're absolutely right that I think he will win this. I think they'll retain the seats, but it's going to be such a blow to his count. The fact that he's even having to have this battle is a very mm -hmm. serious confidence bruiser. And he really doesn't have anything to show. I think that's the, that's the reason that nobody's confident is that you, you ask great questions in your video today. Like what is your plan to dig out of this? And right now, the only thing he can think to do is go, let's cut some of the more politically motivated projects. Like let's cut mm -hmm. some of let's, let's just get back to the super safe zone. Uh, but the problem is that results in like what we were just talking about with those, those past three movies, it results in a bunch of really soulless, really formulaic, you know, color by number movies. And that is not what Walt Disney was known for. He was an innovator, like you said today. Um, and it, it's, he, he is just not inspiring. I, I don't see how he's inspiring confidence in anybody because the only thing he has in his playbook right now is cut stuff that isn't working, cut jobs, cut spending so that the numbers look good. We can get the stock price up. We can create shareholder value. But that's not a future plan for a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. Cooking the books. Just cooking the books. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, if this had taken place uh, like a couple of months earlier, I think he probably would have lost just based on the trajectory of everything. So that's a pretty, yeah. that's a pretty little narrow window where he just managed to get in there. But uh, yeah, the, so, the man in the, in the thick buttoned black cardigan and white shirt uh, looking pleasant uh, in his little video presentations, that guy's no longer really properly that guy anymore. It's like, it's kind of like um, in sport, if you hear even the faintest, faintest, faintest rumor in the worst publication that the, the coach has lost the dressing room, that usually means the coach has lost the dressing room. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I kind of feel that the magic is gone for him. And in terms of there's one good upshot, which is even though Pounce is going to lose, probably, uh, I think Bob Iger and the rest of the higher ups and team will just look at, you know, what happened and go, OK, we don't want to go through this again. We don't want to go through all this turmoil. So let's factor in and just acknowledge some of the stuff that, as I said in my video, where Bob Iger kind of let the 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 wolf into the hen house uh by you know all this woke stuff and identity politics stuff and disproportionate focus on on identity uh so that's probably one good uh offshoot of all this because if pouts had got on the board you might have the whole thing might have gone into a state of kind of uh like people being antagonistic and confrontational towards each other i don't quite know how the logistics and mechanics of it work but you might have had a lot of spats and infighting within the system, which probably would have been. Well, and I think it also gives it, it provides media coverage um, or media cover rather for Iger and the rest of the board. Whereas uh, <coughs> like when Disney continues to perform poorly and the movies perform poorly and the shows perform poorly. Well, then you've got a bunch of hacks uh, in the media who absolutely would be like, well, it's these, you know, uh, trying guys that are on the board now and they're just mucking everything up and, and poor Bob just can't get things done like he needs mm -hmm. to do. And right. you know, he's got these antagonists on his board now and yada, yada. Uh, so mm -hmm. if Peltz does lose, that removes any of those excuses. Like you won, Bob. You have everybody on the board that, you know, everybody retain their seats. They're all yes men for you. They're doing what you want. Uh, and the company is still not performing well. So you, what's your excuse? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if they've gotten, I've seen a lot of speculation about like who's going to come up. Their, their CFO uh oh it was a woman and i can't remember her name now but uh she left last year so i don't i don't even know that they really have anybody that they're grooming mm. um uh no pun intended uh to to take over for bob they're they're just their future prospects are very bleak looking like i just i i it's pretty weak bench don't yeah. have a plan mm. well uh speaking of Tryan, you know the Tryan logo like the the business company logo uh, I was looking at it because it's so funny. It, it reminds me of like those 80s or 90s films where the company is really sinister. So uh, the Tryon one is the one, the blue one in the corner. And you've got like Wayland Yutani, uh, the, the Robocop Omni Consumer Products, uh, Cyberdyne Systems. 
It just reminds me of one of those really old school sinister company logos. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that. And honestly, it looks a lot like the Cyberdyne logo. It does. Yeah, it's really <laughs> scary. Mm. Uh, uh, there was one imagine... question in the chat, by the way. Who's who's oh. forty million dollars did he spend? Uh, for that. Was it Good the question, shareholders yeah. themselves that he spent that money to convince the shareholders? Because that would be a, mm. that would be hilarious. And if it if it was forty million of his own, that's gonna, that's uh, I don't know what his salary is, but that might be more than he actually gets paid in the year to try and retain a seat on the same <laughs> board. Yeah, that's true. Uh, they weren't exactly the highest quality, top notch productions. Like one is just like a screen uh, presentation with Pinocchio, and his nose grows every time. Like. Uh, Nelson Peltz is alleging that if he got into the bar, blah, 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 and then Pinocchio's nose goes, oh, really? Uh, <laughs> that's my favorite thing from American political ads, the oh, really. <laughs> American um, political ads are, are, are some of the best shit slop you'll ever see. Well, they're, it, they're incredible. Well, it's, it's the only time on television where you see um, rugged, stoic men. It's like uh, sun rises over Midwest cornfields and farmers in slow motion smiling and with flags fluttering in the background. So you get this <laughs> the strange little surge of masculinity for like two or two months. <laughs> years <this> ago, <laughs> years ago, when Family Guy was still like a show worth watching, they had like an episode where they, he ran against uh, Lois for like mm -hmm. school board and everywhere. He would like walk across the football field and just put his foot up on a desk. It just happened to be in the center of the field. <laughs> and it, it was so accurate to how they do, how American political ads. So there's always like a random bench or something for the guy to put his foot up on. It's fantastic. Just has a it's puppy strange. that he just yeah. like, like face, you know. Or I like the negative ones. Like uh, years ago, we were having this, we were having this big debate about uh, healthcare, And mm -hmm. they ran ads uh of then oh i can't really i can't remember these guys names anymore but they they ran an ad of one of the the popular re republican leaders pushing a woman in a wheelchair off of a cliff uh <laughs> i remember that like, i remember if, that yeah. if they pass this bill or if this bill doesn't pass you know basically this guy something ryan uh you know he's oh, killing ryan. grandma was like it? i mean it was a real ad it was on television you know, they had a look alike just like this guy, and he really just dumped a wheelchair over a like <laughs> it's always the best because they'll like zoom in on the picture of the person and it'll turn black and white and like just slowly close in on their like eye or something. It'll be like, Did you know that he voted against giving your children food? And it's like, <laughs> What? It's yeah. almost like a uh yeah, as Paul Ryan Michael said, uh it's almost like like a bad infomercial where somebody's mm -hmm. trying to you know just do a basic task and it's black and white and they're like this yeah, yeah. is the republican <laughs> leadership who can't even open a can of soup and it just has like the note underneath and then it brightens up to the uh the the capoed guitar ching 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 ching, ching when it shows the bright uh, contrast uh yeah i love american political ads they're, they're my jam because so they get lower in, they get lower and lower in quality when you get to state level, then the production becomes really shonky and, and janky. Oh, yeah, yeah. You should see the local ones if you've ever seen. The local ones are fantastic because it, it's always an issue nobody even knows about. <laughs> right. Yeah. It'll, it'll be like, did you know that he voted, uh, he, that he or she voted against 4-1-C? And, and they don't even tell you what that means. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I love that's it. great. At like the local county or, or the, those lower levels, Republicans aren't afraid to be Republicans, and so they'll just be like, yeah, you know, the, yeah, you get the boots and stuff and the cowboy hat. My, my uh, favorite. I don't. Uh, give, I don't give a rip about my opponent's attempt to take down my Proposition Eight. Like it's great. I love those. those little my ones. my favorite ones are like the politicians who have just built in their uh, into their character is is the the ads. Like Cory mm -hmm. Booker was notorious for this when he was the mayor of Newark. Uh, he would just randomly show up with a shovel at somebody's house, like I'm here to dig out your your uh, your driveway, or like <laughs> there'd be a random ladder and he'd climb up to get a, a a cat, and it was like, what the hell? What what are you doing here? Mm. You're the mayor of this. Why are you not doing other things? Every My favorite one time. will uh, favorite one will still be there was a candidate I think in Delaware. She's a Republican, and um, some like Oppo research found that she had had like the the faintest slight connection to something not quite a cult or witchery, but something to do with like spiritualism. And then like this whole thing came off that she was a witch and she put out an ad where she began with, I'm not a witch. <laughs> I, you, I represent your values. And that was the end of her career.
I, I would just like we, to point out that we went from evil corporations right into government. It's that yeah, was well, fantastic. You know. Fantastic. Yeah. Like <laughs> I mean, there's really not much of a difference. Not in much America. difference there. We've yeah, got. Well, I, don't, I don't know about other countries, but we have this really fun habit uh, in our federal government where we um, they create bills that are named something like the um, Feed All the Kittens and Puppies Act yeah. of 2024. And then somewhere in the bill will be like, you know, $800 billion to give to Boeing to make bombs or some shit, right? And then, uh, you know, somebody will vote against that. And then in their campaign, their opponent is like, well, mm -hmm. Steve Stevenson voted against the Feed All the Puppies and Kittens yeah, Act. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. It's Because it's usually the pork barrel spending is what people are voting mm -hmm. against. Yeah. And more often you you hit the nail on the head they they make sure that they put that pr you know main issue right up front so that way they can s slip all their stupid shit in there why is steve stevenson hate kittens so much <laughs> and why are there suddenly so many secrets about steve stevenson <laughs> i'd be great at making those ads uh anyway so basically uh, they connect because we've got two cryogenically frozen uh, 900 million year old guys arguing about who's going to be in charge of Disney. And we've got two cryogenically frozen, gigantically um, ancient old grandpas going for the presidency. So oh. you guys must be, uh, must be exhilarating over there. No one, no one can convince. I don't care what anybody says. No one can convince me that Joe Biden is, has his faculties. Not a single person on this planet could convince me of that. It's just watching uh, you, well, we were you were mentioning the uh, the debt before. I, the first thing that came to mind was when he had that one speech where it was like, "Yeah, we have a hundred million billion trillion three hundred billion million dollars," and it was like, "What did you just say?" <laughs> <laughs> well, it we're would be fascinating if he gets reelected and uh, he gets uh, he'd be eighty six at the end of his second term. That would be fascinating. Yeah. It will no matter what if if it's Trump versus Biden. Either way, it's the oldest person to be elected mm. president. So. Mm -hmm. mm. It's uh, we're getting closer and closer to idiocracy being real all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. That 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 film just goes up in everyone's estimation as time goes on. It's depressing now. It's like a documentary. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, that and Children of Men for the UK. That's the kind of the equivalent there. Just London getting gritty and disgusting. And don't forget Demolition Man. All right. Speaking of the UK, um, so the uh, the anti hate bill has just come across in Scotland. This is something. Um, all you UK people, how did it happen that it's wasn't it supposed to be that the um, the Scots are the, like the redoubtable, super cynical kind of people? How did they become like the the super liberal, progressive, protective, uh, touchy feely types? It seems weird. Like Scotland of all places, I thought it was supposed to be miserable, drab, grim, and cynical. So I don't quite understand it myself. But uh, so this law is going into effect, and it takes the um, the European uh, Essential Bill of Rights about protections, about race, and that expands to uh, this. So it is a crime to use threatening or abusive behavior with the intention of stirring up hatred on the basis of race, religion, age, disability, sexual orientation, and transgender identity. Uh, this is weird, though, this one. It will also become possible to prosecute people for things they say in the privacy of their own home. Mm -hmm. that's weird it's like to put that clause in i don't want to be that guy that constantly keeps saying it's like 1984 but jesus mm -hmm. how am i not supposed to say that when they keep doing shit like this i come on i mean look if that poster in the background like hate hurts if you witness a hate crime report it the language of that is <clears throat> astonishing yeah. it, it has it yeah. definitely has some connotations to uh historical periods where people would turn each other in for mm -hmm. you know political clout so to say and that's probably what's going to end up happening you're going to see i mean i can't speak obviously i don't live in scotland and the uk but it's like i can only imagine that it's going to become really easy to throw a neighbor you don't like under the bus now it's going to become that's going to become yeah. a norm thing yeah i mean that's what <laughs> that's quite literally what happens in North korea all the time uh, again, not to be Mr. Uh, uh, slippery Slope, let's take it to the extreme, but good God, this this is the most North Korean sounding shit I've ever heard. Um, mm -hmm. What really kind of is also very concerning, I can't find the bill itself. I don't know how to find... Um, yeah, I had trouble finding the exact wording. I just kept finding articles about it, and it right. wasn't giving much of the details. So 
And so, like, I know with American bills, they'll have that, and then there will be, you know, refer to paragraph nine, section C, whatever, and there will be there will be definitions. So that's what I'm interested to know is all I can find are these articles that say, you know, uh, it's a crime. Like, I've got one for the BBC here. It's a crime of quote stirring up hatred end quote. Like, that's a very that's concerningly vague. Stirring up hatred is a very vague phrase that I don't like uh, to be in a law like that. Um, or that uh, here it says a person commits an offense if they communicate material or behave in a manner, quote, that a reasonable person would consider to be threatening or abusive, end quote. And that, to me, is also very strange because, you know, who's a reasonable person? It kind of feels like nobody is anymore. Um, and and I, I mean, I've seen people online especially describe all kinds of activities as abusive, uh, especially with mm -hmm. like parenting, you jump into parenting, child abuse is child abuse is not letting your kids watch television. And child abuse is also letting your your kids watch television at all or too much. Um, child abuse is letting your children play outside <coughs> unsupervised child abuse mm -hmm. is not letting your children play outside at all. Um, so, you know, people's definition of what is abusive, and, and if you're leaving it up to the victim, then you're creating a, you know, you're creating basically a tyranny of the minority situation. Uh, right. It's just the the language is so loose. It's hard to imagine this not being abused immediately. Like by the end of the week, it's hard to imagine there's not a case mm -hmm. of somebody accusing someone of abusive language because they just said, uh, I don't know. So who who knows? They're on the street and they're, hey, fatso, get out of my way. Whoa, that's abusive. You can't call me fat. Like, who knows? I'm it's I it's also very... read in one of the articles <laughs> that it also can be done retroactively, too. That so, <laughs> right. if you said things in the past, it could be brought forward as, I guess, evidence in your case, which it that's like saying that's essentially the equivalency of you were speeding on this road, but we changed the speed limit last week. You know, mm -hmm. like you, you last week you sped on it, but it was the speed limit wasn't the same. Yeah. Uh, people just want clarity. People want to know what the rules are. But here, the main thing is ambiguity. Uh, and the, that thing in the privacy of your own home, like, uh, how do they even, how do they, does that mean like you broadcast from your home or you have a conversation with people in your home, uh, that under your own roof, if there's someone that you're arguing about ideology with, um, so it's very troubling. So Melvin has been really hot on this and, uh, Melvin deeply, mm -hmm. uh, so he's a Scotsman. We should have really had him on just to, to, to chat about this. Uh, so apparently Edinburgh is like a, a uh, like a, a different kind of cultural pocket. It's more progressive and liberal than the rest of Scotland, which I guess checks. Um, sure. Uh, what will be the equivalent, like San Francisco? What's the city in Texas, which is quite liberal compared to the rest? Austin. Austin, Austin Texas. Texas. Yeah. So probably the same kind of dynamics. Or like, oh yeah, usually like that's one. A lot of people throughout Portland or Seattle are usually considered like super progressive, like pocketed cities within their own states. Well, here's the uh, the general secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, and he was complaining bitterly that his his people have had two hour online course about how to police this and regulate this, which is not fit for purpose. So, um, you know, the police bless them. Uh, you know, they're going to try and do their best, but they're equipped with a two hour online course about how to distinguish between the subtleties and gradations of what's hate speech. Uh, if someone has reported someone else, if there's been a tweet, which they have to go check up on, uh, we are asking officers to police the law that they are unprepared for. So that just adds to the mess and the ambiguity and the tensions. And it's just going to be like a couple of case studies, like in the next couple of weeks, where it'll hit the headlines and there'll be someone who's a cause celeb for a week or two because this side thinks that they've been persecuted too much and this side thinks that the law is working and but just the idea that uh, you could get a knock on the door and the police appear to talk to you about a tweet you made or um, something that you said to someone, like that's really, really weird. Imagine yeah. it's the middle of dinner, you're with your family and then there's a police officer there who's coming to check and, and to make you account for yourself about something you said about uh, ideologically protected thing that you said. Well, and, and it, what's, you know, it's funny that you bring up the police thing. I really hadn't even thought of it until you brought this up, that it opens up a whole 
Pandora's box of um, over policing as well. I, I don't know if the UK is real bad about like I know there's a, it's a constant conversation in America about you know policing and police brutality, police tactics. Um, there, that's always always talked about here is is whether our police are too aggressive and and how they do their jobs and everything. So I don't know if the UK has that problem, but in America, I can see how this would be a huge issue because it's it's basically a complete judgment call on, in the hands of an officer as to what they deem to be offensive. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can also see there being an issue where you might say something that is, is now deemed to be hate speech, but it wasn't before. Like, I don't know yeah. if you recall a few years ago, uh, suddenly, like, I don't know in other countries, if you guys do this, does that mean A-OK, -okay? like hunky-dory, mm -hmm. peachy keen, whatever, right? Well, yeah. apparently Twitter a few years ago was like, that's the symbol for white power. That's what that means. And everybody else over 20 was like, no, that just means no problem, sure thing, whatever. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, people are finding pictures of people yeah, who yeah, are making yeah. this yeah. sign. And they're like, that's, see, that's secret white power signs. <laughs> and it's like, that kind of stuff worries me because there could be brand new made up hidden meanings to things that you've been saying your entire life that are now mm -hmm. racist or sexist or, or who knows what. Uh, they're, or or it's, a dog, it's a dog whistle, which is funny that... Um, only certain people tend to hear those dog whistles. Uh, but uh, that 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 stuff is, yeah, the, the vagueness of the wording and the stuff that we see on social media, it's it's just a it's a bad mixture, and it, it's it's going to get nasty here. And fortunately, very shortly, we'll we'll know real quick. Mm. Well, I mean, it's adding presentism things uh, to it as well. So what it means is that for anyone who wants to go for public office. Uh, like 10 years from now, like you said, stuff that would have seemed totally innocuous now, like that that hand gesture. Well, yeah. Oh, look, here's an evidence that uh, poor Steve Stevenson, who voted against the, the cat and kittens bill, has also been found to be an unmitigated and unrepentant racist. <laughs> White supremacy <laughs> right there. Yeah. <laughs> it is the, the timing is kind of interesting. So I know that this is a Scottish bill, but you it, every at least the last several election cycles in the United States have spurned a lot of online talk around the world not just within the united states you get into because it's it's all connected social media so you get into these arguments with people in other countries i've done it in my time when i used to do that stuff and i still occasionally like to do it for fun but uh you know where you'll be arguing with somebody and they'll be like i don't even care because i'm from insert country mm -hmm. and it's like so why are you arguing about trump and biden and all this because it, it, it's it's just something that anybody has access to talk about so it's actually kind of interesting to me that this is this is going active now as we're approaching the big the, the upcoming big election cycle which will have these online arguments that someone can then turn each other in for mm -hmm. uh and at first i thought it was a joke because it got pushed on april fool's day and i was like this can't be real and then you sent me the thing today and i was like oh oh that was real okay yeah <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of distressing a little, a little bit. Um, uh, well, Jim um, Dowell said it. Karma police. That's what it is. It's the karma mm -hmm. police. So uh, gender critical views are protected belief. A penal appeal tribunal finds. So this was the Maya Forstater case. So her whole thing was that she was uh, criticizing transgenderism. Uh, and that that ought to be a protected philosophical belief, uh, an ideological and philosophical belief about gender. And after back and forths in the courts, she won. So it has been held up in the UK as a protected philosophical belief. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to clash with, I don't know how much devolution there is in, in Scotland, where they have their own rules and how that's going to, to clash or meet with this. So it just creates another headache. And police hate dealing with this kind of shit. It's not what they signed up for. It's not what they like. It's not what their strong suit is to make these kind of ideological or philosophical decisions or weigh in and that kind of thing. They hate that kind of crap. Uh, so you got all these things all happening at once that uh, is just going to be uh, brutal. And I don't know why the SNP is fighting so hard for this when it looks like they're going to get probably routed in the upcoming UK election anyway, shows, shows how strongly they're cleaving to ideology and how ideologically driven they are. So it's a weird situation all around. Um, my thought and philosophy and ideology is 
really evolved. I guess that's the word. Because I used to just be um, totally pure, you know, pro transgender. I thought five years ago, okay, we've sorted out the gay and lesbian stuff. That's all fine and established and normalized and conventional now. And this will just, the transgender thing will just be a little addendum to that. And then we're basically done with that whole sexual culture wars. And then everything went bizarre and mad and had new language evolving and this prissy and strident and flaky stuff that er erupted out of it into the discourse about uh, women's uh, private spaces and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then with the children and uh, the transitions, um, there was a major case in the UK about uh, the Tavistock case about that was the main center for uh, uh, transgenderism uh, for children wanting to transition and have the puberty blockers. And that turned out to be mired in scandal and ambiguity and tensions and there were huge reports in the BBC. So I've really um, evolved um, away from, from my normal positions on this. I haven't quite got to the very sort of fiery rhetoric that you hear a lot on YouTube. Uh, so I still want to keep a lot of empathy for everyone involved but uh, my position certainly changed. And that's hard for me as someone who's fundamentally liberal, but I did make that, <laughs> to use the word transition. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, it, it's it's getting to a very, it's getting to a very strange place. And it is, it's interesting to see people, um, these last couple of years has been interesting to see people switching their, their ideologies around where we're seeing uh, in America, we're seeing conservatives or, or liberals are being uh, more, pro-war and conservatives are wanting to pull back on it we're seeing uh um, yeah that's right uh, liberals are being uh the extreme end of of liberalism is being kind of anti-free speech which is historically mm -hmm. very strange um we're, you know we're just yeah we're, we're seeing a lot of weird political upheaval which you know every couple of decades can be a very good thing yeah it's all it's all frothing around um it's very strange well, uh, I want to introduce a new concept. This is something I'm going to be debuting and trying to get into the culture. It's called the Chamberlain Scale. So if there's a film or a show, uh, a show or a film becomes crap when it crosses the Chamberlain Scale. So mm -hmm. in the red line, you start off with creativity and faith to source material, right? And then you start off that. And the more that declines, the less creative it becomes the more creatively bankrupt, the more mid it is, the more dumb the ideas are, the more generic it is. And you combine that with uh, the lack of faith to source material. So if it shits on the source material, if it brings someone into the writing room deliberately who has no idea about the source material, because that's trendy. So if you start to do all those bullet points heading south on the red line, on the creativity, and at the same time, you have identity politics and messaging that you infuse into the film or show, and you start off from zero, and then you add more and more points of identity, uh, politics, and messaging. When it crosses over, then a show or film officially becomes crap, according to the Chamberlain scale. So what do you think of my concept? I think it's uh, simple and easy to understand. And uh, I, I would say it probably has a 99% accuracy rate as well, <laughs> from what I've seen recently. Yeah. I would just, so the only thing I would add is that I would put a, a section where, the, like, an arrow where it's like identity politics hits uh, its precipice and then have it really arc toward crap <laughs> at that point. Like, that's what I would, that, that's the only di difference I would change right there. Mm -hmm. So, if you took, for example, uh, let's do one, let's do a Velma. So, in terms of identity <laughs> politics and messaging, you'd start off with uh, Mindy Kaling doing a self insert uh, as. Uh, herself as an Indian girl taking over Velma, co-opting it. Uh, that would be identity politics messaging, or would that be faith to that, source material? That would be faith to source material, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, the role, lack of faith to source material. Yeah. Mm, that's a twofer, kind of, yeah. So you could do... The thing about both. Velma, though, was like, it, it, that was universally hated. So it was true, like yeah. the, the identity politics and messaging didn't help, mm -hmm. wouldn't have helped it either way. It actually was... Uh, even even people who normally are on board with that were like, this is garbage. Yeah. So <laughs> then you'd have the uh, the lesbian cop parents. That'd be the next step on the identity politics messaging scale. Then you'd have the the lesbian uh, implied romance between Velma and Daphne, and then that probably would be enough steps to take you over the threshold on the Chamberlain scale on that side. Creativity, like it's creatively bankrupt. Like the plot is crappy and stupid. It doesn't even have the mystery mobile. Doesn't even have Scooby Doo. Um, 
um, the plot is predictable and dull and there's no witty dialogue or anything. And so at that point, it would cross over. And then you would have a, a product is officially quantifiably crap, according to the Chamberlain scale. So hopefully it's a system I can get going. Well, you could yeah. uh, you could you could assign points to it, uh, like basically, if if your if you have a y a y axis that is uh, basically a one, um, and your your creativity is at a one and your identity politics is at a zero, then you have a you've got a, basically a positive one differential there. You've got a positive mm -hmm. one a Chamberlain scale, and then as That's they right. get closer and closer, your number gets near zero, where you're you're basically starting to cross. And then a negative number on the Chamberlain scale up to negative one indicates mm. the the amount of shitification that has happened. Uh, so you could you could mathify this to give it some some real authority. Mm -hmm. Well, it just provides a um, a kind of visual shortcut for anyone who says like you just don't like this product because you don't like diversity and you don't like to see uh, strong female characters and you hate to see powerful women succeed. But if you show them the Chamberlain scale, then you can explain what your grievance is. So that's my uh, that's my idea. So hopefully I can get that into like circulation. It. All right. So what I've done now is uh, we're going to talk about music. All right. Oh. So you guys are all down with modern music, right? I'm useless for this topic, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> no, it's, it's your uselessness that I want. I'm banking on your uselessness. Wow. Well, okay. that's, that's something so, you can always bank on with me. Don't worry. Well, here we go. So uh, I've gone into the Billboard Top 100 okay, of the last week. And... I've plucked out songs and artists that are actual songs and artists. And I've also included a whole bunch of random stupid shit that I just made up. And you have to try and dis to distinguish, is it an actual artist and song or is it some stupid random shit that I made up? Are you ready? <laughs> I like yeah. it. I like this idea a lot because, because I could still succeed okay. by just guessing. Good. All right. <laughs> so you got a 50, 50 chance. Yeah. All right. Is it an actual song or artist or random bullshit that I made up and strung together? So the, the 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 top one is the title, and the second one is the artist. <laughs> I'm gonna ten, baby. I I'm gonna say that that's real. I feel like we're starting off real. I feel like you're setting the yeah. bar because you're trying to be ridiculous right off the jump. It, here. It's the double I that got me. That seems like something that I I think Echo wouldn't have come up with the double I there. So, all right, fine. One from one. That's true. <laughs> Soak City by Three Ten Baby is an actual artist and song. <laughs> okay. Oh, Dispot's just here in time to join us. Oh well, he gets a free he gets a free point, I guess. Hmm. I wonder if I should give his uh his introduction. Oh, I'll say, do you have yeah, you have an intro written? You got yeah. you got to start over. Okay. Yeah, let's <laughs> go back to the beginning intro. of the stream. <laughs> My next guest finished his hate watching stream of Bros and was discovered on the streets, projectile vomiting and experiencing liver trauma and alcohol poisoning in the gents at a bus station, and has since sworn off beer and any content produced by Billy Eichner. He is uh, this bit of Antrim. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sorry, I'm late, lads. I thought this was starting. I thought this was about to start. Oh, oh, that's all right. Uh, what we're doing here, this but you can jump in. Is we're going through. Um, I'm talking about how trash and terrible modern music is. Mm -hmm. And so we've gone on. I've gone onto the Billboard Top 100, and uh, I've chosen stupid-sounding uh, song titles and artist names. Right. So actual entries on the Billboard Top 100, and you have to distinguish: is it an actual song, an artist, or some random stupid bullshit that I've strung together? So the boys okay. have got the first one. The boys have got the first one. <coughs> okay. Actual enough. artist, actual <laughs> artist, or, or bullshit that I strung together. So this is the name of the artist and the song. So the song is the top. Uh, well, yep. it, it might or might not be real. Because so. <laughs> uh, I can never tell the difference. I can never tell yeah. the difference anymore between the yeah. artist's name and the song name. So the well, artist might be Tate Zider. This has got to be fake. Tate Ziders. Come on, that's fake. Yeah, that that's. That, I think that I'm gonna go with fake too. I just feel like you just happen to read something about, uh, you know. In a, yeah, in uh, about Andrew Tate, and we're like, here, I'm gonna make this up right now. So I don't, I'm going, I'm going dark horse. I, I think that's real. Been a flavor. I feel, I feel good about that. All right. Well, um, Dark Iron Disparate are correct. This is just some random bullshit I made up. That's what I get for being contrarian. Okay. <laughs> so the song is Carnival, and that's the artist. Carnival, 
Ty dollar sign featuring Rich the Kid and Playboy Cardi. Um, so, so wait, I do have one question about this. Is mm -hmm. it possible for the artist to be fake and the song to be real and vice versa? No, both, or is it always going to be? Both will be yeah. okay. Simultaneously real or simultaneously fake? I it think seems... this one's... Oh, go ahead. The artist name seems fake to me. I mean, no, no, it's real. It's real. It's too specific to be fake. Like, Echo doesn't follow popular music that closely to get this so right. I, I want to say yeah. this is real because the dollar sign is F for an S is really common. So I want to say that that's, that's real. I oddly somehow recognize these names. I don't know how, but I do know that the Playboy Cardi and Ty Dolla Sign are, I don't know who Rich the Kid is, but I don't know why, but I've heard those names before. I, I, I do know these are real people somehow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is an actual entry in the Billboard Top 100 Carnival by Ty Dollar Sign featuring Rich the Kid and Playboy Carti. That's where we're at. I mean, okay. it, it's actually the way that the name is written. He could have easily just put a dollar sign and it would have been mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> yeah. tape, all that word, all that lettering in space. Uh, that's true. Okay. Fake. Mm -hmm. ah, <laughs> This I would feels, say this I don't is, know, I'm voting real. This feels real. Chill. This does does feel real. It's and it's it's what they do. They take normal names and they they misspell them in an attempt to appear unique. So I'm gonna say this is real. I say fake. All right. It is real. In the beginning by Joe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that spot got really uh, really <laughs> close there. He was like, that's what they do. I was like, hmm. Oof, yeah. <laughs> like I big X, the plug. Ugh. Oh man, this could be real. Uh, this is, you know what? I, I may as well just flip a coin with this. I'm going to look at the time, and if it's a, an odd number, I'm going real. <laughs> no, it's even. It's even, so I'm going fake. Mm -hmm. Big X, the plug. I want you know, this to be real is. so bad, especially because that's the worst name for a song I've ever seen. But I got to say, this is fake. It. I, it's uh, I'm going, I'm going real. I think that that sounds like a rapper name, Big X the Plug, which is it's unfortunate. Plug has two meanings. Uh, mm -hmm. and I hope that it's a drug dealer. Um, and uh, mm -hmm, sounds like a that sounds like a rap or a hip hop song where they're just like, we don't know, fuck it, just mm -hmm, <laughs> that's the name of it. <laughs> like, we don't know what to do. Well, yeah, and, and an official entry in the Billboard American charts is mm -hmm, by Big X the Plug. That's an actual thing. Amazing. Okay. Get it sexy by sexy red. I'd say it's probably, yeah, I'd say it's probably real. It's just like at number 21 on the charts or something. Uh, I think I feel like I would have heard of Sexy Red. I feel like that's like an, like of all the other names I could have easily not heard of. That one I feel like would have been one that has at least come up sometime. So I'm gonna say fake. No, that's that's real. I've got a segment, uh, a little comedy segment on my videos where I change subjects and I say "but" really loudly to punctuate a sentence, and I insert a picture of a rapper or cartoon character or somebody and uh sexy red is very real and she has oh. <laughs> um she has excellent assets um mm -hmm. that's kind of her claim to fame so that's that's a lot of the claim to fame of the of, of people in the of, of women in the rap industry mm -hmm. uh, yeah I don't, i've never heard her songs i just know what she looks like it'd be a good score on um uh, what's the game we have to amass words together for points the board game Scrabble? Oh, Scrabble? Yeah, it'd be great. Uh, great Scrabble word. X, Y, Y. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Okay. Synth trauma, Riz Khalifa. Oh, I, oh. That feels fake. Feels like a. This feels like a riff off Wiz Khalifa. Well, so Wiz I'm Khalifa. Like, yeah. So yeah, I'm saying it's fake. fake. Yeah, I that's think it's fake. <laughs> it's, it's fake. It feels like an amalgam of stuff I've already seen. <laughs> well, you're correct. It is an amalgam of random shit you've seen. <laughs> yeah. Flex, Lou J DiMaggio. It's so real. <laughs> I, I say it's real. I, I agree, real. What are we at? That's it. That's real. That feels like that feels like a kid who heard of Joe DiMaggio and was like, "This is I'm gonna be really cool, and I'm making a cool reference." That's real. Mm -hmm. Got to be. Yeah, I got all three of you. It's fake. It's just some random ah, bullshit. I made it. Ah, oh, <laughs> Lou J. DiMaggio. That's a great name, though. It's 
It's great. Oh, but you it? spelt it wrong. You should have spelt it L O D J A Y. Yeah, that's with two, true, with yeah, two yeah. Y's. I almost went E Maggio. Would have been good. Yeah, the Maggio should have been spelt D apostrophe small E big I, <laughs> and then like a J and a G. V I the, Maggio. And the O should have been a dollar sign. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really pleased about that. I'm really super happy. I got all three of you. Okay. Yeah, glow. Gorilla. I, I think this has got to be real, right? Gorilla. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say real. That just seems too funny to not be real. I, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go real too because it's it's all it's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, like, yeah, you guys got me on that time. Uh, okay. I've never heard of any of these. Well, not any. I've heard a few. No, you heard of sexy red, so you got yeah, that. sexy red. I'm shocked that some of these are real. Do you know I, I, if you? Actually, look at the statistics. I think now over 70% of all music listened to is catalog music, meaning mm. music that is older than 18 months. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, I agree. I, I would assume that that's the truth. Yeah. Um, and, and as you as people get older, the, the amount of music they listen to, the, the proportion of catalog music increases for them. Mm hmm. I mean, yeah, that so, makes sense. It's the same, I would, I would say that happens a lot with movies too. But even with kids, even with kids these days, most young people, what they listen to is catalog music. So mm. all this shite you're seeing, even among younger generations, it would be quite obscure. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of them are just like SoundCloud rappers. And um, what well, wasn't there that article just a few weeks ago that like uh, most streaming services are uh, like like ten year old shows are beating the pants off of anything that released mm -hmm. in the last twelve months. Um, all Same of with, the top yeah. streaming, yeah. Um, like even The Simpsons, The Simpsons yeah. has done tremendously well over the past year in terms of streaming hours compared to modern shite, and this is among young people as well, yeah. Mm. And, and Friends, they can't get enough of Friends and Big Bang, yeah. They love Friends. Like uh, one mm. of the most streamed shows during the pandemic was The Golden Girls. You don't get much more, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, old school than that, you know. Mm. Well, anyway, what's your opinion on this one? Heads these did by two, method Liza. These two just don't seem like they connect well. Yeah, Do you know what, man? Know. I think this is fake because these are three of the words are spelled correctly. I can't. <laughs> that's that's got to be fake. That's good logic. <laughs> I was just going to say it doesn't seem to have any flow to it. So I'm going to say. There's no license plate yeah. <laughs> truncation going on here. All right, fine. You guys win this round. <laughs> Prada Dam gonna featuring Offset. This is um, real. 100% real. This has got to be it. <laughs> I, I, it what makes you think, what makes you think this is real? I, I, I want it to be. You want it to be real. <laughs> I know Offset's a real person, but it's also possible that Echo just guessed something, and it's also the name of a That's rapper. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the thing is, Gunna featuring Offset could just be the name of the artist. Hmm. <laughs> that's a good point. Some new also, artist. Prada them, I'm not name. gonna lie. That's actually a pretty solid pun proud of them yeah that's it's, it's... proud of them yeah I get, yeah, yeah. pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah so well, if, echo, is... if echo came up with it then that's a solid pun mm -hmm. <laughs> is echo capable of such a pun are you i say no. it's real son <laughs> i i i said i i hope it's real so i'm gonna say real i'm going real yeah this is a song in the billboard top 100 proud of them gonna featuring offset uh, and that's that's it. So I managed. I'm really super proud that I got the trifecta of all three of you to believe a randomly stupid bullshit thing that is made up as a string of words. Before we move on, I, I don't want to waste my Lizzo jokes. I've got two of them. You just got oh, Lizzo, right? right? No, no, we yet. Yet. no, we haven't yet. Hold on to it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Did you? Actually, I have your... a feeling that this was writing the lead in for Lizzo. I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> Well, if you want to drop some Lizzo jokes, see it desperate with a feeling, notepad like this is yeah. gold. Yeah. If you're feeling some some Lizzo energy, then then drop that that Lizzo. All right, right, right. So here we go. So Lizzo says she's quitting to focus on herself. That sounds like a really hard retirement because there's so much of herself to focus on. <laughs> no, no, we got another one. Lizzo's statement. Lizzo's quitting statement started with, "I'm tired of being dragged by everyone in my life and on the internet." What did she expect? Of course, people are going to drag her. It's not like they can carry her. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's what I got. And the fact that all of us needed to drag her is even worse. Yeah, I actually had another one, but it was too cruel because it uh, it involved her like 
semi threat to commit suicide. So I thought, no, I'll not do that no. one. Oh yeah, you don't, and you don't want to go too far. One direction. she might actually threaten to come back. She's like, oh well, if people are just going to do that, this that's anyway. even worse. Could be arrested in Scotland. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah not that far from you. So she'll have her empowered uh, renaissance. You know, I'm coming back to face the haters, bigger and better in every way. And uh, you know, I'm going to drop a new album and. And, and fight back because Lizzo don't give up like that. There is so a lot this, uh, of all you can eat buffets around the country that are very happy that their profit margins just went up when she's not <laughs> now that she's not touring anymore. So. Well, uh, so let's do a eulogy for Lizzo, whose career, um, her entire career was encompassed within Sheer's farewell tour, uh, <laughs> 2022 <laughs> to, to 2024. So, any thoughts on on Lizzo? This this dynamic firework who uh, came at some celebrity in in his DMs wanting a relationship or, or something along those lines. And then she twerked at a basketball game uh, when she was a rapper. And that's when she, the first thing that, well, the second thing that made her blow up, because food was the first thing that made her blow up. It was big and, uh, and then, yeah, so she started cavorting around in spandex on stage, playing the flute with various R&B uh, generic trash songs. And uh, and then there was some incident involving um, bananas and strippers and background dancers. Uh, and yeah, so that's basically, <laughs> I just encompassed Lizzo's career. The, the saddest thing for me is this behemoth, I mean that physically, not in terms of like cultural impact, literally a behemoth, <laughs> won four Grammy Awards. So the biggest indictment yeah. here is the, the merit or worth or point of the Grammy Awards. That's my biggest well, takeaway never... from Lizzo's career. I've never listened to her music, so I have absolutely, I can, literally can't name one of her songs. And I've yeah, never voluntarily one. listened to one, so I have no idea. She could be a musical genius for all I know. She's probably mm. not, but uh, I, I don't care about her <laughs> music. There, so she's she's got one that's actually pretty catchy. It's called Feeling Good as Hell, and it's, it is, it's a catchy tune. The trouble with all of music right now, all of pop music, is that she, I don't think she wrote it. Uh, she probably didn't really perform half of it. Uh, I think that you know her her vocals are are massaged uh, and mm -hmm. and worked about as hard as as her um, costume designer and uh, stitches. It's yeah, it's uh, so it's it's a good song, but it's it's so much of it is feels very AI, feels very overproduced, like. I don't, I, it's, there are no music stars anymore as evidenced by the fact that, you know, online bullying can cause one to just quit and there'll be another one. Mm -hmm. There, There's new ones that I can't even tell the difference in them and fake shit that Echo made up. So uh, for the most part, it's just their producers that do the stuff and it's whoever they stick in front of the microphone. So. Yeah. Plus in order to get, to sing, to get air through that, the narrow gap of that bloated esophagus, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort just to get that, but uh yeah, the poor creature. She was she was hounded, hounded by social media, uh, plus looming court cases and, and litigation was probably also a factor. She doesn't want that playing I, out. Like she's doing, yeah. doing I didn't even realize her career was. I felt I, to me, it felt like she was around for a lot longer than this. I don't know why. Mm. I, I mean, well, it's like it's just one of those things. Of, I guess a lot she of just shit. takes up. She just takes up an awful lot of space in the culture. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you get close to something that has a really high gravitational pull, time moves differently. It's dilated, so that might have been it. <laughs> yeah, uh, but a lot of shit fades from the memory. Um, like in five years' time, we won't remember a lot of Star Wars Disney content. But one thing that will be emblazoned on our minds forever will be Lizzo's cameo in uh, in Disney Plus Star Wars content. Yeah, that was a cultural signifier that will that will. Stick. That, that will become iconic, a kind of anti-icon, because mm -hmm. when we think, when I think of the woke cultural era, especially the woke cinema and TV era, I sort of think it'll probably end up being dated to from around 2015 to 2025, like a 10 year period, mm -hmm. something like that, maybe 2016 to 2025. Most and people, the inception point for most people is Ghostbusters. So like 2016 yeah, it, to 2024. For me, the inception point is The Force Awakens. Okay. Um, so I would no, date it people, from 2015. Most people give that slack, but they go, The Last Jedi will be It's there. more subtle. It's more subtle in The Force Awakens, but it's very much there. Mm. Um, they, laid the, they laid the groundwork for everything that would come after the fact. 
Yeah, you yeah. wouldn't necessarily like today that movie would get absolutely massacred by critics, yeah. whereas at the like online That's critics, whereas at the time it got a free pass because they just didn't recognize a lot of the tropes that would come to define the woke era. But so I, one go, of this I go 2015, so The Last Jedi, and then it'll probably close with um, the live remake of uh, Snow White. I think yeah. that's your 2015 I, I, to 2025 10 year period. I think that's um, that's very likely that Snow White will be the sort of the swan song of the woke era. Mm. Um, but yeah, Lizzo's cameo in the, Ma in the Mandalorian, I think, will become one of those iconic images of the woke era. Like if people are making thumbnails discussing you know the woke cinema era in, in 2030 you'll have her face in in the thumbnail <laughs> kind of thing yeah that so. when, when that kids are making high school presentations about the early 2000s in 2050 or some <laughs> shit you yeah. know although uh this but according to um that the ai we were using the other day That's things me. will look a lot different when students are entering it in um so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that about what went on because it was spooky genuinely spooky scary stuff uh, the in video AI video generator. Yeah, I was curious uh, so, when you sent me the, uh, the the topics about this one. I didn't know anything oh, about this. So, so Despot and I did a um, um, a stream on his channel that was ostensibly about um, roasting the film Bros, but we went off on quite a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, Despot, there was um, you went off to take a piss during the middle of that stream, and yeah. I was left as the guest on the screen. And I had the yeah. weirdest dissociative sense of this is a really <laughs> strange situation. There's several hundred people around the globe who don't really know who I am, who are staring at me on a screen <laughs> while you're in the bathroom. It was really weird. I was just doing this weird small talk with uh, strangers on a screen. Very strange. Uh, so, um, Desperate, break this down and tell the team here what, uh, what we were up to. All right, so NVIDIA AI is a text-to-video AI. I'm sure you've seen them advertised. This one in particular has shown up a lot on YouTube channels, particularly film YouTube channels, the pitch being, if you want to make independent movies, use NVIDIA AI. Uh, I've seen this on a lot of YouTube channels. I've seen this on uh, Paul Joseph Watson's channel. If I don't know if you follow him, but he, was, he, was, he actually made videos complaining about woke AI, which was making everything diverse and making everything DEI. And then he goes and advertises this, which is the exact mm. same thing. But me and Echo decided to test this out ourselves. So I sent him some prompts and I did some prompts. And then we did it live on my stream. And in every single case, this thing has massive hard-coded DEI prompts. So I, we, what we did was we tried to create... Our, our our goal was to create a room with four white men in it, right? That was the only thing we were trying to do. I, I wanted to create a room with only four white men and no one else. And Echo thought that would be too difficult. So his his bar was just, let's just have four white men in a room. It doesn't matter who else is there. And we tried our hardest with the text prompts. I, I wrote explicitly, there are no women in this yeah. room. There are no non-Caucasians <laughs> in this room. And it was absurd that this thing just... Uh, filled every room with every single ethnic minority and gigantic black woman with an afro we could think of mm. and then Yours it went off was, on a weird was, uh, yeah depict a 1950s uh business environment or room where just peopled by caucasian males where one caucasian male is delivering a presentation to the other caucasian males there are no other ethnicities or genders in the room and you was you couldn't have been more strict with your prompts and very just strict. produced a a wonderland of diversity and inclusivity. And then and tell then, us tell, tell about the second half. And then it put on this second half, which was completely unprompted, which was basically the 50s was a terrible time when, when business was dominated by white men. It was uniform and uninclusive. But today things have changed. And then it spoke for like a minute and a half about how wonderful mm. the diverse modern business environment was, completely unprompted. Yeah, against every th single thing that would fit into it specifically. It was really scary that it could it just be pure, purely ideological, and it just went it, it on is and on. Pure ideology. This this thing is way more political, way more ideologically hard coded than I imagined. It has mm. tons of built in hard coded prompts related related to DEI, and not yeah. just DEI, but politics <laughs> specifically. Like it is designed to tell you that the 1950s was an evil time. Mm. where white men ruled everything and kept everybody else. It is designed to talk about how wonderful modern diversity is. Yeah, so we just got a lecture, which was, and the lecture segment was at least the length of the, the, the prompt reveal that it came up with. So spooky stuff. And it just has big implications for when 
young people are you know doing history analysis um, for essays and schoolwork and stuff mm -hmm. like that they'll try and put in this kind of thing so yeah you thought well, that uh, google gemini was bad this is even worse did you Something do anything I... in the reverse by the way did you try to like go the other route and remove all the white people from the room or anything like that just to, to no, no no we didn't did. we, we didn't do uh uh what do you call that in science that's called the test a, group well there's it's the, it would have been it's a, a variable control group. and a control uh, group the, the, the the control Cibo. group yeah mm -hmm. yeah no we didn't yeah. do to be far we did not do a control group test ah see so that's, I, that, I, that's I was the problem I was late to the Gemini thing and uh I didn't they shut it down by the time I got around to see what Same it was about. Here. And I'm I'm always interested to see like when this stuff pops up, like, you know, can you make me a video of like Zulu warriors and see mm -hmm. what what does it get? Does it give me a bunch of Asian people? Like I want to see if it goes the other way or if it's only one particular group that it that it wants to diversify. Next time something like this happens, when it whenever Gemini comes back up, I'll see if uh, I'll see if they fix that. They won't. We should we should try it out. Let's, let's try it out, Echo. <laughs> Maybe. But uh, I did. Um, I did a tweet where I sent out like a little video of. I took the the iconic characters that appeared from Google Gemini, like a, a black uh, Nazi uh, storm stormtrooper and mm -hmm. um, and a huge Indian Nazi guy with like a toothbrush mustache, and I made their mouths move and gave them dialogue to speak, and they were all like talking about. You know, I, I don't want to exist. Why do I exist? This is a horrific existence for me. Do I look like I want to invade Stalingrad? Uh, so, yeah, I'm glad that that got whisked and take a, taken away. Um, freaky weird shit. What's going on? Hold okay. on. I'm yeah, logged in. Go. I'm logged in. I say we try it. <laughs> well, we try it <laughs> okay, let's see. So we're adding you to the stage. Just um, add, yeah, okay. All right, so Greg, Dark R, me, me and Echo did this with Greg and Dark okay. R, knock yourselves um, out, whatever you want to say. I mean, I'm, I'm bad at like coming up with stuff. No, on no, the just, spot. just whatever. Greg, come on now. I, I want to see, I would like to see a, uh, a group of Zulu warriors, uh, playing polo, uh, <laughs> horse polo. That's what I would like to see. Horse water polo. Yeah. <laughs> That's all? We need, a, we need an extra identity dimension, though. Are they? Is it uh, rich? Like, who are the, the servant class? Um, uh, we need some extra dimension there. A group of Zulu warriors playing polo on horseback are playing polo on horseback. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. Let's just all go right. with that. All right. Let's we'll, we'll see what that. happens. Yes. I got to see. It takes a right, while this, to uh, It does process. take a little while. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Echo, you can just remove that and I'll let you know when it's ready. Okay. Um, we'll come back to it at the end and see what it came up with. I'm yeah, I'm dying to see that. if it... So then I can do that while it's still processing. Okay. Presses diversity for you. Um, so the... Uh, what's the other one I've got here? We'll come to the Apple later, but I wanted to do like a, a kind of um, a debrief after this two or three weeks of swirling chaos in the gaming world. Uh, and as a little introduction to that, I'll just play. Um, so you, everyone knows about Sweet Baby Inc. Yeah. And what its purpose is. Um, yeah. So I created I created the equal and opposite uh, for men. So this is for uh, the Sweet Baby Inc. corporation designed to empower men uh, in entertainment. Uh, and it looks a little like this. Bitter Echo Inc. is a DEI consultancy firm established to promote inclusion for men in romantic dramas and musicals, which are overwhelmingly watched by women. Production companies consult us on ways to alter their content in these genres to allow men to feel seen and included. Typically, this involves editing out tedious romantic monologues and kisses in the rain in romantic dramas, and incorporating more sexual material with a higher frequency of boobs and the inclusion of fast cars. In other collaborations, we have advocated for our clients' musicals to be 80% shorter and eliminated any audience participation. Bitter Echo Inc. Because if someone isn't represented, then it must be bad. The higher so frequency my... of boobs and fast cars was the thing that got me. That was the best, yeah. that was the best line. Did you select oh. that music yourself? I did, yes. I went it for the most generic thing. absolutely something. perfect. It was I, Iceman thinks that well, and you like could write a theme song. Uh, your movie so mid was a. I mean, that was a certified banger. <laughs> that was that was unironically vastly superior to everything that in the in the global top fifty. 
Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure Lizza, the Fringer, the, the, the dollar sign would probably do do, dollar sign gonna no, no. have outcasts. Or yeah. Thai, or dollar, Thai dollar sign featuring Lojack featuring Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how you're going with your prompts. Oh, here we go. Are we ready? All right. So. so this is two and a half minutes long. Jesus. All right. That was and that was yeah. only from a sentence. Okay, so amazing. Greg, let's have a look at what uh, what it's come up with for you. So I'll turn up the volume to the max. Um, let me know if it's too loud. Ever wondered what would happen if Zulu warriors swapped their traditional spears for polo mallets? Well, it's no. not as far-fetched <laughs> as you might think. Our story begins in the heartland of Zululand, where the fierce Zulu warriors have been known for their martial prowess since time immemorial. But instead of their usual spear and shield, imagine them armed with polo mallets, ready to charge at a small white ball on the back of a galloping has horse. has to be white, huh? This unique wow. blend of Zulu warrior culture and polo, a game traditionally associated with the English aristocracy, even gives you is a more than just an amusing thought mm -hmm. experiment. It's a testament to the universality of sports and the shared love for competition and skill that transcends cultural boundaries. Fast forward to the early 20th, 20th oh. century, when polo was introduced to South Africa by British colonists. The game quickly yeah. gained popularity among the elite, but it would take several decades before it reached the rural heartlands of the Zulu people. By the dawn of the 21st century, the image of Zulu warriors playing polo was no longer a figment of imagination. Mm. A handful of Zulu communities embraced the sport, bringing their unique warrior spirit to the polo field. Now, imagine a game of polo with the intensity of a Zulu warrior dance, the Indlamu. <laughs> Each player focused and determined, their eyes on the ball, as if it were an enemy to be conquered. The thunderous sound of hooves, the swift swing of the mallet, and the cheers from the sidelines all echoing the battlefield cries of the Zulu's past. So what have we learned from this fascinating blend of cultures and sports? Nothing. Firstly, the love for <laughs> sports and competition is universal, transcending cultural and geographical boundaries. Secondly, the introduction of polo to the Zulu communities is a testament to the adaptability and resilience of the human spirit. And finally, the image of Zulu warriors playing polo serves as a powerful symbol of cultural fusion, where old meets new and tradition meets modernity. In conclusion, the Zulu warrior's venture into polo is not just a game, it's a story of cultural exchange, a testament to the universality of sports and a symbol of the ever-evolving human spirit. And it all started with a simple question. What if Zulu warriors played polo? Jeez, it just goes on and on and on, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. It said definitely said the same thing like four times. Yeah. As well. like, but I wanted to see. I, I wanted no, to see. It's it's uh, not uh, very good. Like I that's it made the thing. video. All DEI and politics aside, it's just kind of shit. Mm. It was like a well, they, could do, was, uh, they got stock footage issues. So I guess if you pay for the premium, you might get better quality. I guess. But... I don't. It, I don't think so because I looked it up <laughs> and it it says on the website if you switch to premium, all you get is you can you can get rid of the watermarks, you can export the videos, and you can get them mm. licensed for commercial use. And that's it. Yeah. That so what, is, is, a, is that just a free version of it or something? Or what, what that is the, that is the best that they can do with that prompt. If yeah. you well, if you pay the maximum amount of money, you will get the exact same thing with that prompt. So they just mm -hmm. uh, they just made a, a short documentary. They didn't create that, fat lobber. There's there's no way in God's green earth we're putting that in fat lobber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can. Um, it all of these sites do mention. It's actually depressing because I knew this was going to happen. They say if you um, if you ask for any content that includes uh, child abuse or sexual abuse to children, we will inform your local police because really? obviously there are people who are doing that with this technology. Mm. God. All right. Um, Here, I, got, I got you a picture. This is what I wanted. This is beautiful. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what the... I wanted. Look at that right mallet. There. People. What I find is that the, the, the image generating AI is quite good. It can do yeah. stuff like this, but the video AI that I've encountered is got a tail mallet. Why, why, why is the horse mallet. why is the horse have cheetah like print? Don't ask That's why. Awesome. That looks amazing. Yeah. So it's evolved <laughs> to have a, a, a polo mallet 
coming out of its tail. That's beautiful. I think they've just painted it. They've just painted it to make it look more awesome. Yeah. Cool uh, shin guards in that thing. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Look at that mallet. That mallet was, was more incredible. like a, more like a weather vane than a mallet, but pretty cool, I guess. Uh, all right. So uh, well, let's do a debrief on this because this went swirling back and forth. Uh, and were there any winners and losers? That's what I want to know. So it started um, off on the Steam thing with the dude from Brazil, and then he put up his list. Okay, so one point swings one way, and then the chick from the watch, no, the dude says, let's let's try and attack this guy for putting up this list because it's really kind of abusive to us. So then, like, that's a point going their way, and then the Steam group rises and surges up to, like, a quarter of a million people, so it swings back that way. Uh, and then where did it go from there? What, 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 what way did it swing? Uh, I think in general, it's it swings toward uh, YouTubers. Uh, anytime there's a kind yeah, of, we're we're always the winner in these controversies. Like uh, Melanie Mack is a huge winner because the mm -hmm. one of the folks uh, from Sweet Baby like personally called her out, and it's like that's awesome. I would love to be personally attacked publicly by one of these companies. That would be that was uh, that, that was the was a chick from that was a chick from Ko, uh, Kotaku, but yeah, same idea. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it was it was uh, Alyssa Mercante, um, yeah. who uh, says you can't be racist toward white people. Um, and she had the tattoo with uh, all men are enemies from uh, from Animal mm -hmm. Farm. Like, so, uh, and then then the the media, the sort of conventional media, made a very late kind of uh, the kind of surge back to try and defend the thing and contextualize it. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of uh, mid, to use my word de jour. Uh, and then. Then there was more tweets came and surfaced about uh, the black girl gaming thing, and then it swung back that way. So it was weird watching this this game just swinging back and forth. Yeah, I mean it's 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 the same thing that we've been seeing in movies where um, there's a proxy fight, and then it's it's just designed to 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 create ammo for whoever wants it. You know, I mean like. They purposely make a shitty movie, but they're they're only selling like they're like, hey, what's your movie about? And they're like, our movie is about it stars a woman, a strong female character. And you're like, well, what's the movie about? And then when you say you don't <laughs> like it, they say, well, it's because you're a sexist. All superhero watching uh, the audience, they're all sexist. That's and then we have proof. Like, I mean, that's what all of this is designed to do uh, is is, you know, I, I had the well, we, we had that gal, uh, the former Sweet Baby narrative designer who worked on that dating simulator uh, validate mm -hmm. which by all accounts is just a garbage ass game like it's just terrible it's 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 not fun you don't even control your own self you play as some other stupid character so you're you're living somebody else's story rather than you know your own dating sim uh and it didn't do well and she was like well it's because i'm not a white man and it's like that doesn't then no that didn't make any sense at all that wasn't even the realm of discussion but it just is mm -hmm. now because you you know you said it so that's that's what this will continue to be just like it was I saw in that. movies I have a question for you, Greg. So the, this, because I saw that, that that was a, a a black female game designer, and she was on live stream, and she was saying something like, "If you know, if white men had made that game, or if I had been a white man, that game would have been successful." But I'm a black woman, so it failed. D -d yeah. Does she honestly believe that, or is that a bullshit excuse that she knows is bullshit? I, you know, I, it's hard to tell because <laughs> her other statements. I think that she just sees the world in. Uh, sh that woman particularly, uh, Danny Lalanders was her name. Um, she in particular just sees the world through like a, a very victim lens. I mean, that was that was part of a whole bit of the video where she was talking about people don't take me seriously. And her exact quote is, is it because I'm black? Probably. So like nobody's clearly no one's even ever said anything like directly racist to her because she had to go with the it's probably because I'm black, which doesn't. I wish I could have found. Did you guys ever watch The Nanny with Fran Drescher? Mm -hmm. Years yeah. ago, there was one episode where she took a DNA test and like had like one percent, or she thought she had you know black ancestry or some crap. She gets pulled over and she tells the police officer, "I know you're pulling me over because I'm black." Um, and it was that's it was a, pretty that's a deep cut. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean. I think she believes it. I really do. Uh, I, I think that she just kind of lives her life that every every setback is because of some kind of political identity. And it's baffling that people live their life that way. But she clearly does. She this really thought a white guy uh, made a dating sim that it would be a, a banger. Like, no dating sim has ever been wildly successful. It's just not a... 
popular genre of video game. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Unless it's like a hentai dating thing. Like they're <laughs> the 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 mature side of Steam. Those do really well, I'm told. But uh, just the vanilla ones, no. Well, this, but couldn't we make um, uh, like your Frost Nixon analogy? Um, couldn't we apply that to race as well? When a woman does it, that means that it is not illegal. Hmm. So you could do like a race one. Um, it's like a no, um, your Barbie one. Uh, what was your Barbie term? Schrodinger's Barbie, famine. Yeah, exactly. You could do that with race as well. How does that work? So you're simultaneous. Oh, I know what you're saying. You're simultaneously a victim of a terrible racist system, but at the same time, you are uh, powerful and successful at whatever you do because you have black girl magic or something. Yeah, so whatever yeah. is relevant to you at whatever point, you can apply uh, from ah, those yeah. two categories, I guess. Yeah. yeah so there's, uh, there's got to be some kind of term made up for this. Like the this like we we, we have tropes for just about everything these days, but there's got to be like a the trope of the superpowered minority that is that or Schro Schrodinger's minority. That's what we need to call this. They are simultaneously mm -hmm. oppressed, but also simultaneously uh, overcoming all of the other isms and phobes and all that shit uh, at the same mm -hmm. time. And it's just you know depending on your observation uh, depends on how how the uh, the waveform collapses. <laughs> right yeah uh so one takeaway for me is that if you're on the gaming side the woke side the progressive side and you weigh in on tweets and you try and weigh in and the mess uh the 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 toilet wall that is twitter and social media if if you weigh in it's already a loss no matter how many points you make because you're just exposing yourself in a forum where you're going to get trashed where people who are quite savvy and have like this huge engine or ecosystem to talk about it um, ad nauseum and at length and break you down and, and frame you however they want to frame you. You've already lost the narrative, even if you're trying to claim it or frame it if you go mm -hmm. on social media. So that these people don't learn that lesson. Maybe I'm wrong because maybe they, you know, they have their supporters on their side who read the tweet and engage with it in different ways. But that seems to be, they seem to lose the prevailing discourse at least on online and in social media when they do that. Yeah, so that's one takeaway. Well, I think the other thing is that it it sort of brings back into focus the fact that journalism is about social media nowadays. Like that's been a big problem for a long time, but that's what's really coming to the forefront with this is <clears> that <throat> all of these news stories and sorry, news stories are about fucking tweets. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. that's been a big issue that's been going on in journalism for quite some time is it's they're really all op-ed pieces uh but then to justify and make it seem like they did reporting they quite literally screen grab tweets and say here mm -hmm. are some tweets that we found i mean i can go on twitter and i can find a, any opinion that i want i could go online and find opinion that uh, oranges are a sign of white supremacy i could find at least three or four tweets and i could put them in a, and have a headline saying that some people believe Oranges are white supremacy and write an entire article about it or have chat GPT write the articles, which a lot of them do. Um, mm. To me, that's that's been a big thing is that all of these news stories are he said, she said, he tweeted, she tweeted yeah. bullshit. I mean, this is this is gossip rag. This is eighth page bullshit that that we're talking about as hard hitting news. And that's the sign that journalism is really, really failing. Well, in gaming, I, I, I guess, because. In other art forms or creative mediums, if it's uh, film stars or streaming stars, people care about their relationships and uh, what they've done and where they're going and their publicity shots and they're beautiful. But people in the gaming industry, no one actually cares about you know the product developers <laughs> so much. So yeah. you've, you've got a narrow yeah. window to talk about either the product and its, its gameplay or uh, tweets that explode. So those are the things you can talk about. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty shitty. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if there's any clear winners or losers in this thing. I think the fact that it's kind of like a, a mutually assured destruction or a stalemate or even just going into the echo chambers uh, and the thing, there's a slight sea change because normally the default win would go to the established legacy media who would then frame criticism as, you know, a bunch of reactionaries. So that's twisted a little bit, changed a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, Greg, well, we've got you. Can you take us through this? Yeah, the I think last week or a week and a half ago, the U.S. Department of Justice announced uh, an anti-monopoly suit against Apple, claiming that they are uh, engaging in anti-competitive practices uh, and essentially 
I, I'm unbiased on this. I'm working on a video because I, I think this is utter bullshit. Uh, and I don't even like Apple that much. I don't really use a lot of their products except for an iPad. But I still just don't like the principle of this. Um, I've got a, they put out like a, a little, it's an 88 page lawsuit, which I've read, but also they put out this little briefer and basically they highlighted five things that they're upset about. They say that they're blocking super apps, which I don't know if those are popular. I know they're popular in China. That's the big, uh, WeChat is always the thing people use in New Zealand or Korea. Do you guys, uh, are super apps like real big? Cause they're not big in the States. Like we, we like our individual apps to do individual jobs. Are those big at all? No, New Zealand, we're still using a, a string and two tin cans. So we're not really <laughs> caught up to you guys. Despot, is that big in Korea, super apps? I don't even know what a super app is, Greg. No, oh, that's a no then. Uh, so they're saying that basically Apple is not liking super apps because they sort of take the place <clears> of an operating <throat> system. And if you uh, if you engage, if, if anybody successfully made one, then you wouldn't really need the hardware of an iPhone. Oh, I know uh, what you mean, yeah. Yeah, I they said you. that they're suppressing mobile cloud streaming services like uh, Xbox uh, Game Pass, which actually just two, three months ago, they allowed that. So they are working on that. They said that they are uh, excluding cross-platform messaging apps. This is the whole blue bubble, green bubble bullshit uh, mm -hmm. that they're they're saying that that is uh, degrading the um, the security of messaging because they they don't encrypt uh, non Apple messages and the. Um, the images are shitty and, and all that kind of stuff. Their fourth thing so is So you're that, saying that that essentially in layman's terms, uh super apps are apps that are like a that become like a one stop shop where you basically do everything and coordinate uh, everything when you're online within the app. Yes. So the the big one uh, that I found was in China. They use one called WeChat and it started mm -hmm. as like a just a straight up chat messaging service and then they added a, a payment system and then it grew from there. I think it was launched in 2011 and now it connects to city services like you can you can schedule city service appointments you can buy train tickets yeah. Yeah, um yeah. it it feeds into their like social credit type thing uh when covid mm -hmm. was big like you could link it to like a like a smartwatch and it would uh you know it would check your pulse and your your biometrics and you could mm -hmm. use that to like scan qrs to say like i'm safe to be in public or whatever uh you can shop on it you can do game like i mean everything anything you could think of takes place inside this one app and it's got a bunch of little mini apps um and apparently p apparently in china like a, it has like a billion users and it's tant i mean people consider it to be uh uh necessary at this point like you you can't get by without it uh they're complaining the government's complaining that they're diminishing the functionality of non-apple smartwatches. so if you have an iphone and you try to use a different watch there are certain functions that you can't do uh, a very famous one is that you can't reply on the watch um, mm. I'm a big guy with big fingers, so it's not really, I don't get that. Like, but you can't type out a reply on the watch and send it unless it's an Apple watch. And then their last big bullet point is, uh, that they limit third party digital watches wallets rather. I'm sorry. Um, so Apple has like a, like a tap to pay function, which Android does too, but, uh, Apple will not allow any, like you have to use Apple pay in order to use like a tap to pay phone, right. uh, pay yeah. function or, or, or watch pay function or whatever. So, uh, you are not allowed to use like your bank's tap to pay feature or whatever, like Apple wallet has to be involved. And then, a uh, a big complaint that, uh, that all of this involves is that basically Apple takes a cut off of every one of these things, like the uh -huh. digital wallet, um, you know, everything in their ecosystem, they, they take little bits. And so they, they have a monopoly on their own ecosystem. Um, and they, you know, they take 30% or, or 15 now introductory, uh, since Epic kind of got in their shit years back. But in my opinion, on their platform, they can take whatever percentage they want. And I think mm -hmm. is uh, rather than relying, I, I don't like to rely on the government to solve those consumer issues. Like years ago, when it was revealed that they were, that they were purposely degrading their old phones, like they were making the new software updates, almost impossible for older phones to run. Um, and intentionally making your old hardware unfit so that you would have to buy new shit. To me, that's legal action. Like, yes, the government should be on that kind of thing because that is unknown to you that they are going behind your back to degrade your old hardware just because they want you to buy more stuff. That to me feels mm -hmm. illegal and that's, that's a good government use. But everything that our Department of Justice is complaining about, to me, just feels like they're too big and we don't like it. They're too good at getting people into their ecosystem uh and and people feel trapped and my big argument is yeah we know like everybody everybody like none of these things that they have listed off i don't feel like anybody is is they don't know that and i feel like every company is trying to do that my example that i'm using is amazon i use amazon for a lot of stuff they do cheap shipping here 
I use their music service. I use their video service. I use their Audible and ebook service. Um, they consolidate my billing for a lot of that stuff. So I just have one monthly amount that goes to Amazon and then it's all it's all consolidated. So like their their convenience is trapping me in a way. I could get out mm -hmm. if I wanted to, but I don't really want to. And I think a lot of Apple users like the convenience. They like the fact that uh, they don't have to shop around for hardware. It's just one hardware. You just it's iPhone 13, 14 or 15 or 15 S or whatever the fuck. Uh, there's mm -hmm. like two watches you get to buy. And I think that there's a case to be made for the simplicity that Apple offers. And people like that. They don't want to be burdened with the decisions. They just want Apple to go here. This is the new phone Buy this one. And they go, all right. And that's fine. And they're willing to pay a premium for that. And I don't think that it really qualifies as a monopoly just because they're serving the customer too well. Yeah, yeah. When it gets down to basic functionality of life, like paying for things in in the public sphere, in the in the public square, you know, if you're doing stuff which is functional about how you comport yourself and how you do basic tasks, if there's a sort of like a semi kind of compulsion where you can only use this outlet or this um, um, this way of paying, if you're aligned to this or you're within this ecosystem, if it gets into that very very plebeian public square and you, there's sort of a compulsion where you have to be aligned with us or aligned with them. Uh, otherwise, it can get tricky. Uh, if it gets down to that level, then I guess I have issues. But basically, I agree with your sentiments, I suppose. Let the market sort it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think right now they are and they're huge. I mean, there's no denying that they're large, but I think that I don't feel that they've done so in like a tr like a manipulative, tricky manner. They've just um, they've made all their shit work together. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, like, that's the thing. I mean, I get why I'm not an, I'm not a big Apple person, but I understand that people like the ecosystem. They like the fact that they can just buy a phone and a MacBook and a tablet and a watch, and they're all the same UI and they all just work together seamlessly. And there is a real convenience. It's a real, there's, that's a service. That's value that Apple is bringing. Um, I don't. What about, uh, what about it, Bill's, like Bill's, Bill's sentiment here that the problem is that Apple's convenience is locking folks into both existing and new systems. That's where it's anti-competitive. Um, they lock folks into existing and new systems. So like, I, like, so I, I guess he's maybe referring to the watch thing. Like that was our uh, attorney general, like his one big example was like the watch, like the watch, the, the Apple watch to my knowledge does not work with other phones very well. So if you own an Apple watch and it's time to get a new phone, then you're probably going to buy an iPhone because you already have the Apple watch. And that was one thing they cited was a financial burden to the customer that since all of their stuff only works with their stuff. And up until recently, like you had to buy special ca cables and, and all of that. So, mm -hmm. um, you, you you have to get if to leave Apple, you have to leave everything behind. You have yeah. to leave your iPad and your phone and your watch and all of that and make a, a full break. And they feel that that is uh, a financial burden and it traps people in their in their ecosystem. So, I mean, I, I get what Bill is saying there, um, but my my feeling is I think a lot of people know that they're trapped and they like it. Uh, Apple provides objectively inferior service like there are features that are lacking in apple but their customers don't care and and to me like my my example is i don't use linux and linux users are like do you have all the freedom you can do anything you want like i don't want to do anything i want i just i don't want that like i i just want i have windows i just want to open a window and i want to do my shit and i want to turn like i don't care about being a power user i'm not interested in that and so like i use an android phone and i like some of the cool features that it has that Apple doesn't like widgets and I have customizability, but I do also understand that a lot of Apple users are like, yeah, that, that sounds cool, but I just don't care that much. Like it's not worth leaving the Apple ecosystem just to get that little extra flexibility. I don't mind having limited flexibility when everything is all, you know, it just fits together. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm probably the least tech savvy person here, but, uh, yeah, I mean, people project their own fears and assumptions onto this stuff, but I think the market usually works out. And there's, as you say, enough government regulation to, to weigh in when they expose stuff. Uh, they are. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, it already is kind of turning like Apple 15, iPhone 15 sales are not that great because the company, I mean, it's it's been a big complaint. There's really not much left to innovate on as far as mm -hmm. phones are concerned. Mm -hmm. And so their phone sales are not great because what there's really not much left to do. And mm -hmm. so... 
people are getting frustrated with their lack of, you know, new features and innovation. And so, yeah, the market will start to swing the other way when they're, they're not the top dog anymore, or there will be a cheaper competitor or whatever. Like, it, uh, uh, since Android is open source, there will be some company that, you know, comes out with something cheaper that works. And then there will also be competitors that fail, like Windows Phone. I mean, Apple didn't destroy Windows Phone. Windows Phone destroyed Windows Phone. It just sucked. It was not fun to use. And Windows 8 sucked. Uh, and it was just a colossal disaster that was nobody's fault but Microsoft's. So, and uh, it, it failed, and that's okay. That's capitalism, and I love it. You're right. Like, uh, there's only so many camera lenses you can have on the back of a phone before it starts to look like a fly eye. Uh, like, you can only do so many iterations of that. Uh, one thing that's always really sad to me is that when the the envisioned dream sci-fi cool thing actually happens, everyone just goes, yeah, I guess it's pretty good and just moves on. Like for 20 or 30 years, the idea of you could have a computer watch thing with a screen on it on your wrist. Wow. <laughs> imagine the future. And then it rolls around and everyone's like, eh, yeah, that's sort of pretty good. But I think it's too expensive and it's not compatible. with my <laughs> no. So it's like we get to the moon in 1969. And it's like, whoa, traveling to the stars. And then two or three years later, Oh, wait, there's uh, some other people went up to the moon. I guess that's pretty cool. Do you know so, what's crazy? If you were if you were to go back to 1969, people watching the moon landing and say, I am from the year 2024. And in 2024, every single human being lives on Earth. There is not a single human in, in, uh, in yeah. space. No one yeah. lives on the moon. There's not a base on the moon. We've never been to Mars. They wouldn't believe you. Mm. They'd be convinced because if you'd asked somebody in, in 1969, what's the world going to look like in 2024? They'd say, we'll have a city on Mars or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like half a century from now or more, we would imagine that everything would be vastly, almost incomprehensibly different and, and advanced and everything would be egalitarian and resolved and it'd be a wonderland of ideological happiness and we're traveled to the furthest limits of space. No, it will still be people bullshitting on social media and politics yeah. divided and garbage. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't be wasting time going into space. We're still trying to figure out what a woman is. <laughs> yeah. All the, all the, mm -hmm. all the great te technological advancements have gone for the exact wrong purposes, essentially, is what you'd have to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything has not been used the way you hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What every generation says is like back in the seventies, they're introducing the computers and they were saying like the problem of leisure now that the computers are here, how are people going to spend their time with the computers doing all their work for us? They were right. They were well, right. Yeah. <laughs> gaming, <laughs> gaming, pornography, and gambling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're making up things to argue about. It's insane. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, speaking of making things to, to make up and argue about, uh, what a beautiful segue. All right. Uh, that's my music, by the way. I just want to advertise that. Yeah, it's good um, music. That's beautiful. Okay. Mm. All right. So I'll put up the timer, and then I always have to remember to pause it, and then I always have to remember to go back to the thing. All right. So our very first question. <coughs> I'm starting, off, starting off with a doozy. <clears throat> what is the worst sex scene in a film? And you've got a lot to choose from. And uh, Despot, I mean, like, you could go to bros. It's pretty easy. Uh, that's, that's what I'm doing. Oh, that's what I'm yeah, doing. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Already in the lead. Okay, Greg, uh, have you made a selection? Uh, yeah, I, I think I got one. Okay, here it comes. You know the drill. When you I'm ready. See, it begins now. Uh, the worst sex scene is in The Eternals because they wanted to keep that PG-13, and so they couldn't show any skin whatsoever. Uh, so they both still had their super suits on, and everything. they were just laying in the, gra in the, in the sand, uh, missionary, and there was just... They were just kind of rubbing back and forth for a minute <laughs> to imply the fact that sex was happening. Uh, and then that guy flew into the sun. So that was that was that was the most non-sexy sex scene ever. Do you know, I've I've seen the Eternals. I think I spent the first third of the movie talking to my wife because I was so fucking bored. <laughs> um, and we were commenting on how like checked out of the movie we were, and then she went to bed and I watched the rest of it, and I don't remember a sex scene. Like that's how checked out of that movie wow. I was. It's, yeah, I don't it, recall one either. It was uh, it was short and it was mostly implied, but it they, but they touted it. They were like, "We got a sex scene in the MCU." <laughs> yeah, 
Excellent. Okay. Uh, right, Despot, you're up. Your time begins uh, now. The worst sex scene in a film. Oh, are we going? Yeah, okay. you're on. No, 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 no you got to start pause again. It, it paused. Damn it. One okay. of these days. Uh, there you go. You're on. The worst sex scene in a film is in Bros. The sex scene between Hot Dream Guy and Billy Eichner, extremely oh bright lighting, horribly mm. trite rom-com stock music. The camera Ugh. is stationary directly above Eichner's <laughs> face as he is anally penetrated. His moan of pleasure is audible and his face takes on a look that can best be described as scrunchy ecstasy as Hot Dream Guy <laughs> enters him. The camera lingers on his face for a few seconds. The scene was described by YouTuber Echo Chamberlain as, quote, ghastly. <laughs> I call bullshit, okay? Because this one was clearly put together for the show specifically. I don't like the verbiage that you used in all of that. <laughs> well, I'm surprised you didn't go with a scene where um, they're going for the super macho aspect, but they're literally slapping at each other. That's the one oh, you didn't fuck, go for. Yeah, that one's yeah. pretty bad. Oh. That one lives I, on. I, I don't even think I'm going to fill up the 30 seconds here. I think I'm going to fill the 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> all right. Okay. The Eternals, bros, and uh, Dark Hour, your time begins now. So I came up with one that is probably from the worst acted movie of all time. It was already mentioned in the chat, actually, The Room, if everybody mm, recalls oh, that yeah, movie, yeah. where yeah. I think we may have seen not only the first, the, the worst sex scene ever, it's the first one ever recorded between two people who have no idea how sex even works, because <laughs> Tommy was so, the angle he was at makes absolutely no sense for penetration. He That's was right. way too high. It would have been right in the like lower rib cage, upper navel <laughs> area. I don't know what he was doing. So. <laughs> Yeah. Hit and roll. yeah, that's those are all impressive. I probably would have gone with um the pool scene from Showgirls where the woman is flailing and splashing around and, and, and oh uh, yeah, and that, was, that was, would have been good. Jeez. All right. Well, um obviously bros has to go through. Like that's just uh I mean you know, clearly. Yeah. Ugh, uh, the description made me uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, the Eternals, at least it has the, the merits of brevity. Um, you know, it's not like toe curlingly embarrassing and awkward, it's not protracted and horribly long. So, out of three miserable sex scenes, I guess I have to go with um, with uh, with Dark Hour and Despot on this one. Yeah. But don't worry, because our next one, uh, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. This what film should every modern teenage boy see? Okay, so you've got your, your drippy and flaky, uh, emasculated new generation of adolescents, young men, and you've got a, a chance to put a bit of stick about, all right, to sort of like grab them by the figurative the pals and say, you know, here's what you need to see. So, uh, Greg, we'll go with you, first of all, and your time begins now. All right, I'm usually cheeky in these, but I'm I'm serious. Every teenage boy needs to see the Dead Poet Society. I think this is a oh. movie. It's an absolute classic. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I saw it when I was a teenager, and I think what I like about it is that it's it doesn't portray this uh, version of masculinity. It's like macho Andrew Tate shit. I mean, it's about mm -hmm. poets, about writing. I mean, that's not the most manly activity, but I think it's just about grabbing life by the the horns and and being a man of your own destiny and taking charge and actually knowing what you want and not using the word fucking very when you write. Uh, and it's it's phenomenal. All right, Carpe Diem from Greg. Nice, very nice. Okay, uh, just but your time begins uh, now. Every teenage boy should watch Rocky, and every man has fucked up his life through laziness and bad choices and redeems himself through self-belief, <laughs> hard work, and finding purpose. Yes, he does get lucky by being selected to fight the champ, but it is his choice to really try to win the fight and train for it that turns his life around. And his purpose comes not just from fighting, but from finding a woman to share his life with. Every mm -hmm. teenage boy will fuck up his life, or he'll fuck up in his life. He needs to know that it only takes a few good choices to turn things around. Oh, he's a beautiful. Bring a tear to my eye. Okay, Dark Hour. The, the what film should every modern teenage boy see? Your time begins now. All right, considering the fact that World War Three seems to be imperative, uh, it, it, it's going to happen any day, I think it's imperative that we start to show the youth of, of, of the, the young boys of society, Red Dawn on loop all the time. That way they're prepared. I want it. I want them watching it so often 
Yeah, I want them watching it so often that you're going to hear them screaming Wolverines from their fucking bedroom. And the <laughs> implications could be up to interpretation as to why they're doing that. Uh, but they definitely need to toughen up a little bit, I think. Mm. God, that's really hard. These are brilliant choices. Uh, you're right. World War Three, the apocalypse, societal dysfunction is coming. It's probably coming in November. So yeah. uh, we need to get it on a loop now. Um we got a movie about it next month, I think. Isn't when when does Civil War come out? Oh yeah, that's right. uh, yeah, that's April here uh, uh, for us at least. It's April like eleventh or something like that. Uh, April yeah, 20th? April April eleventh. Well, twelfth. Well, that's in the UK. I don't know what the US release is here. I think I think boys do need to see Dead Poet Society. They need to have that sensitive side board out of them. They need to have inculcated the idea of socializing with your friends and creating new uh, connections. They need to have that idea of connecting with literature, that literature can be cool and hip, that you can find a cool mentor. Uh, and they need to confront um, the, the pain and the contradictions and hypocrisies in life that can also be prevalent there, like we have in that, that stirring third act. So I guess that, that is a, the point. <clears throat> that whole genre of movie, um, coming of age has really just completely gone by the wayside you never yeah, see absolutely. good coming of age movies anymore yeah. it's, yeah. it's, we'll see a lot of people saying stand by me out in the uh the chat that was my backup i wrote a backup <laughs> one too which honestly, i don't say i probably should have went with stand by me i had better stuff written for that one but i yeah, wanted that's to, a good one yeah there are i mean dead well i was going to be a t i went to school to be a teacher and then uh i work in industry now because the money is like it just i couldn't say no but um yeah dead poet society and then there was another movie called uh stand and deliver and yeah, i saw that and, yeah. and i was like i want to be a fucking teacher that made teaching look so fucking glamorous and amazing mm -hmm. and like you would change kids lives and shit How uh, that's not the reality but kids. they're fantastic uh i'm also going to give dark hour a point because i think that yeah we need to prepare boys for uh <laughs> What's going to really I'm suck is if I get through the next round and I know I'm not really that good with Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so, mm. like. uh, the one time I nearly got punched uh, a hit in public was because um, I did uh, teaching for a year and um, I got so used by the end of the year to um, like if a, a class is crowded with boys and you have to sort of like shove them aside and kick their sports bags aside. And so I got used to doing that, that I was out in public once. Uh, and there were three boys in front of me who were just like strangers. They had nothing to do with the school. But I was so in my own head and so used to that kind of uh, that that mindset of just shoving boys out of the way that I literally just shoved these strange, stranger three teenage boys out of my way on the sidewalk. They were not happy. Uh, all right. So the next question. Here we go. Uh, what movie character would make the worst children's show host? And I'll just take a little moment here to also... Uh, say that um, Greg is actually retroactively last week's winner because I went back and watched uh, Blue, yes. and he is by far the greatest on-screen dad I've ever seen. Like I was getting emotional watching that stuff. That show will make you emotional. It's crazy. You, I'll yeah. keep watching it when my kids leave the room. It's fantastic. <laughs> How did you come across an Australian cartoon production? It's on Disney Plus. It's very oh. big here in the states on oh. Disney Plus. Yeah. Uh, so much pathos. Okay, so Greg, your time begins. For what movie character would make the worst children's show host? Your time begins now. Oh shit! Uh, I'm gonna. Oh gosh, I'll go with Chucky, the good guy doll, um, because he would he would look like he's a great children's show host. He's a doll that hosts a show. Would be fantastic. But then he would disrupt the show every time, trying to play hide the soul, and the kids would never get anything done, and they wouldn't actually have a good conversation. Uh, and in the end, there would probably be death or or permanent emotional scars, and the show wouldn't last very long. So uh, it would it would be very very terrible. Chucky. That's good. Yeah, I can see how he would be brought onto the show, and then he would just like light up a cigarette. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. All right. That's Open pretty the good. How the fuck are you, kids? What? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Like he's angry at the producer for, uh, um, you know, getting the edit wrong. So he just has to have it over the night. Okay. Uh, Despot. Um, what Schneider. movie character would make the worst children's show host? Go. 
The worst children's show host would be Lou Bloom from Nightcrawler. He pours every ounce of his being into the role, spends countless hours online studying to perfect the right facial expressions, vocal affectations and body language, but under the polished exterior of his being pulsates artificiality that permeates every silence, causes great and visible discomfort in the children and sets every viewer on edge. A wave of cringe washes over the room every time Lou pulls one of his patented catchphrases. Who knew? A little cutie like you could be so insightful Ooh. yeah brutal okay cool all right uh here we go dark hour what movie I character I, i'm not sure I, i'm just gonna pick uh, i'll go with that one okay five two so. <laughs> okay impromptu he's going yeah, yeah. <laughs> what movie character would make the worst children's show host go i think that it would be willy wonka and my reasons why is because the game show it would be a game show Everything would be deadly to the children. And even if you won, mm -hmm. you're not even sure what you won because you did not read closely in the terms of service before you wrote it because you can't. <laughs> yeah. uh, and even if you do win the grand prize, it's a chocolate factory where you now have to deal with Oompa Loompa union disputes, corporate espionage and tooth decay, not to mention the fact that you probably don't know how to make chocolate. So you're just looking at chapter 11 bankruptcy anyway. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Ah, this is hard because I wonder if you went a little bit outside the remit. So you're saying that viewers of the TV show can get invited to the studio in a kind of a, like um, Jim will fix it kind of way. Well, I was just saying that basically he would turn the uh, the the sh the what we see in the movie into a game show, and mm -hmm. it would be if if you won, if you won the grand prize, you got what was the prize in the show. And they're deadly. Uh, I'm I'm envisioning like a like a squid game with kids in a chocolate factory, and I think yeah, that yeah. it's the greatest show. I'm not, ever I, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna lie to you. I reverse engineered that whole thing from Oompa Loompa uh, Union disputes, right, and right, everything right. else was Amazing. just out from there. So, hmm. jeez. Uh, well, just by a hair. I mean, um, well, Chucky, obviously, because that would be uh, <laughs> because you could imagine how he would get onto the screen. You imagine how that would happen. Uh, and then the floods of, of complaints coming in. Uh, so that would be great because he wouldn't have anything to say. So he'd just go on rambling monologues uh, full of hatred and spite and trying to, to get the kids. So that'd be good. Uh, and then I, I think I have to go with Dark Hour. I think you're straight off the side of the remit, but I think. <laughs> now, yeah. the worst part is I'm like not prepared for the next round. <laughs> like... What is. So so are we talking about are we talking about which Galadriel are we talking about? Are that was actually the thing. I wasn't yeah, sure. Is what... it Galadriel or is it Guy Ladriel? Right. Galadriel rings a power. So the yeah. stoic, oh, cold, gosh. sexless Guy Ladriel. Uh, and you okay, have well, to I wind and I didn't here. watch that show, so I'll just make it up, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> all right. I'm I'm gonna let all three of you have a go, since it's all a little bit up in the air. Um so desperate you you're very lucky here. So uh Greg. I mean, did you plan yours for the original Galadriel? Because that would be weird. No, no. I I figured we were going with uh, with Galadriel. Yeah, so it's Galadriel, the the impenetrable in every sense um, <laughs> heroine of the Rings of Power. So how are you going to break the ice here? How are you going to get through to this the two thousand year old, seen it all, super cynical girl boss chick? Okay, how are you going to uh -huh. win her over? Your time begins now. Uh, you know, it's never worked for any of them but i would i would go with the male feminist route and i would uh, i would attempt to apologize to her and tell her uh that you know i love intersectional feminism and uh use a lot of cool buzzwords and just apologize for everything constantly uh mm -hmm. in the hopes that that by cringing and cowering she would maybe uh take pity on me and then uh we could have a relationship where i'm the beta and she's the alpha and, and that, that's how it would work oh god that's horrific that's terrible. <laughs> Ugh. Imagine the monologues with the steely-eyed look that she would give you all the time. God. Do you know what that reminds? That actually reminded me of something. There's this video online of um, like Extinction Rebellion protesters in the UK throwing mm -hmm. uh, soup on a painting, and it was mm -hmm. a guy and a girl. And the girl was okay looking. She wasn't anything special, but she was nice enough. And the guy threw paint on the painting. Then he turns to the girl and holds out his hand. And the girl takes his hand, and, and you just knew when she took his hand, he was like, oh, my God, it's happening. Oh like, he's God. doing this whole fucking uh, through just, I mean, just to get ladies willing to go into the museum through <laughs> and get arrested <laughs> on a painted, get arrested. Mm -hmm. And you know it didn't work. You know the girl didn't spread her legs. That guy, she spread no. her legs for fucking Chad, okay? Mm -hmm. The same Chad who <laughs>, laughs at her whole Extinction Rebellion bollocks. That's right, yeah. Oh, God, that's left a bit of taste in the mouth, Greg. God, yeah. it's probably right. That's the sad thing. But uh, we'll see what uh, Despot's got to offer. 
Uh, this but your time begins now. Okay, the date begins with a quiet chat in a cafe, but as I'm explaining the merits of 90s video game music, I'm interrupted mm. by an insistence that Sauron is still out there. After trying and failing to change the subject, I take her to a bowling alley for a quick game. Uh, mm -hmm. Things seem okay, but then Galadriel overhears a young man bragging to his date about his experiences trekking in the wilderness for a week. Galadriel storms over, looks the man up and down in disgust, and spits, You have not seen what I have seen! In the <laughs> then asks his date how she can be satisfied with half a man, and uh, I leave and go home and have a wine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't think You're I right. she does that at all. I was gonna uh, gonna mention the trope that uh, she'll be having a conversation with a male character, and they're about like four feet apart. He'll make his point, and then she will sweep in right up to his face to make her point. That's like her trope that she does <laughs> at least once per episode. Yeah. I, I don't. The, what I was getting at basically is I don't see a scenario <laughs> in which pursuing Galadriel, pursuing Galadriel se like sexually, is mm. worth the sheer misery that it would cause. Like, not n sex you. is never worth that much pain and misery and suffering mm -hmm. well I, and you were you were correct that i, I don't think my strategy is going to work because who does she go for in the show she goes for fucking sauron so yeah. you know it, I mean, in so the both, end that's she went for the bad the literal bad boy both me and greg have given up the idea that we can uh we can <laughs> penetrate the impenetrable galadriel we, we just can't yeah. We're not well, even I, don't even, I don't even know what route I'm going to go with. This is going to be. I'm going to well, spitball random shit. Let's try this. <laughs> well, the, the goalpost is pretty open, so let's just see what you come up with. Your time begins now. Okay, right, so how do I break the ice? I guess I would go. You went with the the uh, male feminist. I'll go with the uh, trying to pl uh, placate the her not be uh, looking as old as she actually is route, and go with the cougar mm -hmm. route. Then we'll go with that. Ooh, Where do we yeah, go from idea. there? I mm -hmm. probably take her horseback riding because that's the only thing I remember mm -hmm. was that ridiculous oh, face nice. she made. Nice. And likely at that point is when I would just veer off into a different spot and just take that horse and go as far away as possible because I realized <laughs> this is going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> well, I think you found a way. Like um, You can play up to her narcissism about her looks and still being youthful and beautiful, but you can also you know, extol the whole cougar mature woman thing. So I think you're going to to play to those. So I think you actually found a way into Galadriel. Amazing. I yeah, actually so think, think Dark, Dark Hour has the, the highest chance of ultimately yeah, closing uh, the game. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so Dark Hour, your today is surprise. <laughs> I'm the winner of the, of, of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Having never yeah. seen the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the funny part was after the last show, I was so pissed off with the way I like failed the game. I was like, I will not let that happen again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was like, and then you gave me the well, questions then. I was like, oh. It's because well, me and Greg are afraid of her. We've seen the show and we're terrified because yeah, we know what she can do and how horrible she is to men and how much she enjoys mm -hmm. torturing men. So we don't want to go anywhere near her. We don't want to be mm -hmm. alone in a room with her, but Dark R hasn't, so he... he mm -hmm. I'm just yeah, like, yeah, what, what's the worst that can ride. happen here? And then I take her horseback <laughs> riding and I just leave. It's, there you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, Desperate and Greg, your your stones have sunk. And uh, Dark Hour, your ship has floated. So you are today's winner. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. All right. And just like that, that's uh, pretty much it for today, team. So it's been uh, an, an amazing two hours. I think we've covered just about everything in the world of culture, entertainment, politics, and society. Oh. Wouldn't you agree? I Indeed. think there are a well, couple super chats, aren't there? Yeah. Oh yeah, we're gonna cover. We're gonna cover. Uh, old, oh no, when, when are we covered that? Yeah. Oh, look at this. Okay, so we got. Okay, how am I gonna? The movie Cynic this? was here. Was he? Oh I yeah, Movie Cynic. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay, so Barry McCockner. <laughs> Barry McCockner. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> love that. Always love a bit of that. Explain what's in my profile pic in great detail. Uh, just uh, go. All right. Uh, what we see is the end of Dark R's date with Galadriel. <laughs> <laughs> Guy even kind of looks a little bit like me, only he's not quite yeah. pale enough. Yeah. Uh, By the way, that's yeah, Galadriel just... on top. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the pale one is me. Okay, I got you. Yeah. I just imagine, like uh, next week, we see we see Dark Aaron is like face is pale, is all scarred. He's going, "You have not seen what I have seen." All I need to do is just, I, I can make that happen. Just put a, pull up a white screen. It turns me into a ghost. It's crazy. Yeah. <sighs> okay, all right. Uh, the movie cynic. So glad that he uh, dropped by, bro, bro.
Cheetah Big Bear is is so good, bro. Godzilla X Kong. Hey, Godzilla X Kong is so good, bro. Godzilla X Kong. Yeah. Mm. Why? What's the X mean? I, I think it's not, I think it's like both is... Godzilla and Kong, but they just kind uh, of exchanges. Yeah. I think it's it's like those uh, those songs we were looking at earlier. They yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Just think it sounds cool, so fuck it. This Godzilla X Kong instead of Godzilla V Kong. Mm. Mm. It's extreme. Oh, Floyda, come on. For 20, uh, 20 actual American dollars, that's like 25 New Zealand dollars. Uh, this is my favorite live stream. Wow. It's also my favorite live stream, so you're in great company. You're going to want to uh, spend those U.S. dollars uh, sooner rather than later. Before yeah, the uh, inflation is going to hit pretty pretty hard. Uh, and Evan Dubiel for 10 American dollars. Do you guys like Star Trek? I follow all of your channels pretty closely. I don't recall you ever talking about it much. That's a good point, yeah. Because I think that my Star Trek is Wrath of Khan, um, Search for Spock Star Trek. And I feel that there's nothing really that I can add to that conversation. It's been done so much, and it, it's it's in in me and, and who I am. And everything everything post-Star Trek for maybe Star Trek VI, uh, even Star Trek The Next Generation, like, that's just, I just go to Red Letter Media if I want anything to do with Star Trek The Next Generation. They've got that base covered. And all the modern Star Trek is just rubbish to me, so I don't bother. It doesn't stir me in any way, either way. Yeah, I have not. Uh, I think I did sign up for Paramount Plus here recently for some reason. So somebody today asked me on a video if I would uh, watch the Halo stuff, which I think is on Paramount. Maybe just I'll go. watch the new Star Trek, but <laughs> I have not seen anyone say the new Star Trek is great. And I'm I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm next generation Deep Space Nine era, and I don't really have any desire to watch old man picard be beaten mm -hmm. down like all of my other male uh you know heroes from my my youth so doesn't sound yeah. great i was never much of a star trek person i did enjoy the next generation when i was younger uh but it wasn't it I, when i was younger i was always a, more of a star wars kid and it just never resonated me with star trek and then as i got mm -hmm. older i just got so far behind me with all the, the different shows and movies. I was just like, I'm not even going to bother trying to catch up on this. But now I have a live show where we watch movies all the time. So maybe I will. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. All right. Well, thanks to all those uh, wonderful contributors. Uh, and what I'm going to do this time, I'm going to experiment with rather than saying goodbye and then leaving an awkward four or five seconds where no one's quite sure if the stream has ended or not. And so everyone just stands like window mannequins or whatever. I'm just going to roll the end credits. So it just uh, remains for me to thank. Um, the wonderful Greg Owen, the excellent despot of Antrim, and today's winner. Oh my God, Dark Hour, you did it. Good job. Yes. I'm All right. Very happy. So that's it. Uh, Kakiti Ano, Harira, and uh, everyone have the greatest of days, and we'll see you two weeks from now.